Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is a pleasure to have you all here at day two at the Alexander C. Cushing International Law Conference. Today we will focus on naval force developments. I would like to remind you few of a few administrative matters. First off, I'm Lieutenant Commander Cynthia Parmley. I'm the US Navy Military Professor at the Stockton Center for International Law. We're delighted to have you with us today. First, the conference will run from 1100 to 1530 Eastern Daylight Time each day, and we are respectful of your time and will try to remain on schedule as best we can. Second, the chat feature is disabled, so you must use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. And using this feature, you may also upvote questions, uh, questions you also want answered or particularly like. And so we encourage you to engage with our expert panelists by asking questions in the Q&A box. Third, Zoom has a closed caption option for those who would like to read a live transcript of the conference. You can activate the live transcript feature at the bottom right of your Zoom application. Finally, the entire conference is being recorded and will be available on the Naval War College YouTube channel shortly after the conference concludes tomorrow. Now I'm honored to introduce our first speaker of the day. Vice Admiral John G. Hannock, Judge Advocate General of the U.S. Navy, will provide an opening keynote address. Vice Admiral Hannock, over to you, sir. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Cynthia. I appreciate uh, the chance to um, uh, speak to you today. Uh, can you somewhat confirm, am I on camera and broadcasting? Yes, sir, you are. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. What a, a great privilege to uh, be able to open day two of this conference on rule of law and a great power competition uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. At the start, if you would uh, just let me uh, add the disclaimer, very similar to those stated by yesterday's lineup of staff judge advocates, and that is that my comments uh, represent my personal views uh, and don't constitute the official position uh, of the U.S. Navy, the Department of the Defense, or the U.S. government. Now, yesterday's uh, uh, discussions were entitled uh, Staff to Javagate Perspectives, and those presentations, along with that of the Deputy Commander of the Pacific uh, Area for the U.S. Coast Guard, raise a number of themes that I think are going to translate uh, and carry over into today's discussion. Let me just outline a few. Now, one is the importance that uh, our operations be underpinned by the rule of law and that they have a solid legal framework. Number two is that the international law that's related to maritime zones and uh, operations at sea uh, are part of a broader set of international law and norms that have led to a stable and open international system. And further, that to continue to provide the greatest benefit to all nations, this law, these norms, using the words uh, that were used yesterday, must be shared, common, universal and inclusive. They should not easily bend or be shaped to the benefit of a single nation. Whether such changes are pronounced through fiat or pursued through incremental changes in state practice that go unchallenged or a combination of those methods. And three, that while the term great power competition might include some aspects primarily associated with military power, and be associated with nations having a relative greater amount of military power. Today's competition requires a whole of government approach with allies and partners of all capabilities playing a crucial role. So today's session shifts towards naval force developments. And I think the forthcoming presentations on the Senkaku Islands gray zone operations involving the maritime militia and the Indian Ocean maritime security, they promise to reinforce and to bring new light to these themes in the context of ongoing and significant developments in the Indo-Pacific. Now, let me speak for a few minutes on the broader topic of naval force developments from my perspective. The People's Liberation Army Navy, or PLA Navy, has become the world's largest naval force. 
The PLA Navy has tripled in size over the past 20 years to about 350 platforms, including surface combatants, submarines, amphibious ships, and auxiliaries. Many of these platforms have been fitted with advanced anti-ship, anti-aircraft, and anti-submarine weapons and sensors. The growth of China's shipbuilding facilities and enhancement of its submarine force capabilities in particular are unmatched in the region. New weapons, weapons systems, and platforms are being researched, developed, and fielded. These include land-based conventional and ballistic cruise missiles, hypersonic weapons, integrated air defense systems, and even unmanned and artificial intelligence-enabled vessels and systems. And all of these are rapidly changing U.S. views and U.S. strategy. According to a recent DoD report, China has already reached parity with or even exceeded the capabilities of the United States in some of these areas. China is also rapidly expanding its information operations in an attempt to achieve information dominance. The development of increased cyber warfare capabilities has become a part of China's strategy to disrupt enemy military operations in the initial stages of a conflict, including honing its ability to launch cyber attacks that could cripple critical infrastructure. Electronic warfare aimed at degrading or deceiving electronic equipment and information systems has also become an increasing focus. Added to this is China's growing interest in further developing its space and nuclear weapon capabilities both of which seem to be moving ahead at a notable pace. And it is this context in which the former and current commanders of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command have testified to the U.S. Congress that the erosion of conventional deterrence is the greatest danger in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, to avoid that erosion of conventional deterrence, the U.S. Navy, the Marine Corps, and other military services are adapting. The Navy has reviewed and continues to assess the force structure that is needed for the future. Yes, numbers and types of platforms matter, but so do capabilities and weapons and networking and the ability to connect and operate with allies and partners. We heard yesterday of new operating concepts of the U.S. Marine Corps. These are significant changes that tie in to the tri-service maritime strategy that was issued in December 2020, signed by the Secretary of the Navy and service chiefs of the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and the Navy. The tri-service maritime strategy recognizes that while the military services must be prepared to prevail in the event of conflict, they must also operate effectively across the competition continuum. As I expect today's discussions will highlight, effective operations in the day-to-day -day competition are not easy. But the objectives outlined in the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy emphasize some of the same themes we heard yesterday, and that will continue today. That the U.S. and like-minded nations must uphold the rules-based order that we must find ways to deny use of incremental coercion, that U.S. operations will uphold global maritime security and governance by setting the standards for acceptable conduct at sea through principled leadership in the International Maritime Organization and other multilateral institutions and forums, that in concert with allies and partners, the U.S. will uphold these standards around the world. And that a resilient network of allies and partners is the fabric of this free and open order. And together we must detect and expose actions that violate international law, steal resources, and infringe on the sovereignty of other nations. Now let me shift just for a few minutes to a topic that I don't believe was discussed yesterday, but is a growing concern to the United States and likely other nations in the Indo-Pacific. 
And that's the topic of marine scientific research, known as MSR. Recently, the U.S. has seen China aggressively increase its marine scientific research activities. And with the larger perspective of China's naval expansion and increasing maritime activity, it might be easy to gloss over MSR, which can be routine and perfectly legitimate and consistent with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And we may therefore assume China's activities are not of great interest or consequence. However, China's MSR endeavors are increasingly far from the customary practices envisioned by the Convention for Scientific Research. In recent years, China has been attempting to blur the distinction between what constitutes research for civilian scientific purposes and what information gathering will, in fact, have military ends. So China's alleged use of civilian academics on board civilian operated vessels to conduct military surveys can and should be called out as inconsistent with the law of the sea. And just a few weeks ago, China signed a deal for the construction of the largest scientific research vessel in its fleet. The new vessel will be capable of operations anywhere in the world except for the polar regions, indicating that China in, anticipates continuing and expanding its MSR program. And while this expansion is not in itself objectionable, growth of the speed and significance should not go underappreciated by the international community. China's close civil military integration, evident in a variety of locations and MSR related efforts should be cause for concern. While this activity was limited to the first island chain early on, the U.S. has seen its expansion into the Pacific, particularly surrounding Guam, and more recently into the Indian Ocean as well. This appears to be coordinated and intentional efforts to increase China's expertise in the undersea domain and the potential implications for U.S. operations and the security of U.S. territory does not go unnoticed. Now, there's one final aspect of naval force developments that I want to touch on, and that's operations. It's been a very challenging year for every nation, including the need to mitigate impacts from COVID-19 throughout activities in which we undertake experimentation, exercises, training, and deployments. U.S. forces have continued their presence in the Indo-Pacific. And we heard yesterday of recent exercises involving Japan, France, and the U.S. We also heard of a forthcoming deployment of United Kingdom Naval Forces to the Indo-Pacific AOR. And while these exercises and operations continue together, we must ensure that China's experimentation, its exercises, training, and deployments, which also continue, do not leave in their wake either sudden or incremental changes to the free and open international order. Regarding today's discussion on the Senkakus, it is worth noting that the Senkakus are under the administration of Japan and therefore fall under Article 5 of the 1960 Treaty of Mutual Security and Cooperation between the United States and Japan. Presidents Obama, Trump, and Biden all recognize Japan's administration. And in the fiscal year 2013 National Defense Authorization Act, the US Congress clearly stated that the unilateral action of a third party will not affect the United States acknowledgement of the administration of Japan over the Senkaku Islands. And in today's discussion about both the Senkakus and the South China Sea, Concerns stated yesterday about the new China Coast Guard law should ring loudly. To quickly summarize yesterday's discussion, the China Coast Guard is the world's largest. It has been increasing in size substantially in recent years. It's regularly employed to defend China's maritime claims, as well as to engage in more assertive actions in and around disputed waters and features often as the preferred alternative to the PLA Navy. This allows the China Coast Guard to operate under the guise of merely engaging in local law enforcement efforts. 
masking national intentions that are contrary to the rule of law under the facade of what should be, I say should be, a benign, lawful, and in fact, law enforcing activity. In particular, the new law authorizes the China Coast Guard to use all necessary measures, including firing weapons, to stop what it views as infringement of its national sovereignty, sovereign rights, and jurisdiction by foreign vessels. It says the China Coast Guard can defend the key islands and reefs, protect maritime boundaries, and guard artificial islands and facilitate, uh, facilities in the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf in, quote, waters under PRC jurisdiction, and, quote, in the airspace above waters under PRC jurisdiction. Now, of course, what constitutes these waters and airspace is not defined in the law, raising obvious questions about whether these terms are grounded in international law or whether they rely on China's excessive maritime claims and whether the maritime zones are based on China's legally unsound and soundly rejected nine dash line. If that is the case, as many commentators anticipate, China could interpret the new law to extend jurisdiction to all of the disputed waters and features in the South China Sea as well as disputed waters in the East China Sea. China's enactment of domestic laws likely intended to strengthen enforcement of unlawful claims is of significant concern. In particular, China Coast Guard enforcement of maritime claims within the nine dash line would mean China is enforcing claims rejected outright by the arbitral tribunal in its binding ruling in the 2016 South China Sea case. Now I want to add a brief discussion of the 2016 arbitral tribunal ruling that involved China and the Philippines. I'll start with a short story about the May 2018 conference in Beijing. It was sponsored by the Center for Ocean Law and Policy at the University of Virginia. Also by the National Institute for South China Sea Studies, the Chinese Society of International Law, and the Korea Maritime Institute. I'm sure some of you were there as well. Now, I don't have a transcript, but I recall one of the final presenters was a UK professor and public international uh, lawyer from London. He spoke frankly, including summarizing a discussion he had during the conference with a Chinese law student. That student had included in an academic paper some comments or analysis of the arbitral tribunal ruling. And upon review, as I recall it, a professor advised the student to remove those comments and ignore the ruling. Now, as we were in Beijing, you can imagine that the room quieted with everyone waiting for what would be said next. And then the speaker continued with a simple, deliberate, declarative statement, something like this. The ruling is not going away. And so part of the challenge for all of us who care about the rule of law is that the ruling not be allowed to just go away. And so despite China's initial attempt to ignore the ruling and its later attempts to raise substantial doubts about the validity of the ruling, it mattered that in July 2020, on the anniversary of the 2016 ruling, the United States restated its commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific and strengthened its policy on the South China Sea in light of the ruling. The U.S. Secretary of Defense made this statement in reinforcing the effect and validity of the arbitral tribunal ruling. He said, we are making completely clear Beijing's claims to offshore resources across most of the South China Sea are completely unlawful, as is its campaign of bullying to control them. Other nations have made statements in support of the ruling, 
And as you listen to today's presentations on gray zone operations and the maritime militia, you might also think about how you and about how your nation can uphold the rule of law as it relates to the South China Sea and the arbitral tribunal ruling. I may conclude by noting that we are at an inflection point centered on the Indo-Pacific region. It's critical that we uphold the foundational principles of international law to maintain the rules-based international order. Together, we must strive to defend the principle of peaceful resolution of disputes, which is facilitated when we maintain law and policy transparency. Together, we must continue to defend the principle of freedom of the seas, which is guaranteed to all nations under international law. And together, we must continue to challenge the actions that limit this freedom by invoking questionable or flawed legal arguments. So thanks again to the Naval War College and to the Stockton Center for hosting this event. And I look forward to today's important sessions from every presenter as you talk about your perspectives on events and activities in this vital and critical region of the world. Thanks for your time today. And again, it's my privilege to be here with you. Thank you, Vice Admiral Hannock, for a fantastic opening of day two for our conference and a great synthesis of the discussion yesterday on staff to advocate perspectives. Um, we'll now continue with this session five on East and South China Seas, moving to our first panel discussion, the Senkaku Islands and tensions in the East China Sea. Our moderator today is Captain Toshinari Matsuo, Director, Operational Law Office, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force, Professor Atsuko Kanahara, Faculty of Law, Sophia University, and President of the Japanese Society of International Law, and Rob, Professor Rob McLaughlin, Australian National Center for Ocean Resources and Security. And you may find their detailed biographies in the conference program. So I'd like to shift over to our first moderator, Captain Mitsuo. Okay, uh, can you hear me uh, on my own? Broadcasting? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I am Captain Matsuo, uh, Director of Operational Law Office, Commander of Staff College, uh, Japan Maritime Missile Defense Force. Uh, I will moderate a uh, topic of the Senkaku Islands and the tensions in the East China Sea today. Uh, this topic is structured by three presentations. I will start with an introduction and overview. And Professor Kanehara will follow and talk about the Senkaku Islands and maritime law enforcement and Japan's Senkaku policy plus the Chinese Coast Guard law. And then Dr. McLaughlin talks about the Senkaku situation links to uh, how the Senkaku situation links to the South China Sea situation, how and why the East China Sea and the South China Sea situations are similar, but uh, also different. After the presentations, we have some time for Q&A. Um, then let me start uh, with an introduction and an overview part. Um, I will prepare for sharing the screen. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me start. Um, first, geography. Uh, the Senkaku Islands are a group of islands which include Wotsubi and other islands. The Senkaku Islands are located 
at the west edge of the Nansei Shoto Islands uh, of Japan. The Senkaku Islands are also situated approximately 170 kilometers from Taiwan and 330 kilometers from China. Although they are currently uninhabited, the islands were once home to Japanese people who run fishing businesses there. History of Japan's administration and valid control over the Senkaku Islands. In January 1895, after having carefully ascertained that there had been no trace of control over the Senkaku Islands by another state prior to that period, the government of Japan incorporated the islands into the Japanese territory by lawful means under the international legal framework. After the incorporation, Japanese civilians settled on the previously uninhabited islands, having obtained permission from the government of Japan. The islands counted more than 200 inhabitants at one point, and the taxes were collected from the inhabitants. After World War II, the San Francisco Peace Treaty placed the Senkaku Islands under the administration of the United States as part of Okinawa, thereby reaffirming the island's status as part of Japanese territory. Furthermore, the Senkaku Islands were included in the 1972 Okinawa Reversion Agreement between the United States and Japan as part of the area over which the administrative rights were returned to Japan. The Chinese government didn't contest Japan's sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands for approximately 75 years. Picture above is a World Atlas collection published in 1958 by a Chinese cartographic publisher. The Senkaku Islands are referred to here as Senkaku Group of Islands and Wotsuri Island. They appear as part of Okinawa. This changed in the 1970s when significant attention was drawn to the islands due to the potential existence of the oil reserves in the East China Sea. The May 1969, the Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East report indicated the possible existence of oil reserves in the East China Sea. After the announcement of the study results, China and Taiwan began to claim sovereignty over the islands for the first time. Neither state had made any claim to the Senkaku Islands whatsoever prior to this. Chinese sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands claims were made by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China in December 1971. Following this, China altered textbooks, maps to create its own claim to the sovereignty of the Senkaku Islands. Picture bottom left, Chinese textbook from 1970 called the islands, the Senkaku group of islands. This was modified to the picture bottom right, 1971 textbook changed the name of the islands to Daoyutai Islands, and the border line is curved toward the northeast. During the Japan-China summit talks in 1972, Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai mentioned the Senkaku Islands to Japanese Prime Minister Kakuei Tanaka, 
stating that it became an issue because of the oil out there. If there wasn't oil, neither Taiwan nor the United States would make this an issue. From this, it is clear that the unilateral argument made by China was not based on international law or history, but on the potential existence of oil reserves. In 1992, uh, China enacted the law on the territorial sea and the contiguous zone, decreeing by law for the first time that the Senkaku Islands were part of China's territory. In fact, its statement on China's territorial sea of 1959-58 made no reference to the Senkaku Islands, and there was a clear change in China's position. For these reasons, there is no doubt that the Senkaku Islands are clearly an inherent part of the Jap territory of Japan in light of historical facts and based upon international, international law. Indeed, the Senkaku Islands are under the valid control of Japan. There exists no issue of territorial sovereignty to be resolved concerning the Senkaku Islands. Chinese fishing boats surging around the Senkaku Islands pose significant security concerns. September 2010, a Chinese fishing trawler in Japanese waters near the Senkaku Islands deliberately crashed into Japanese Coast Guard patrol vessels. It is pointed out that the so-called maritime militia is playing the role of the front guard for supporting China's maritime interests. Since 2008, China has been sending government ships to the waters of the Senkaku Islands and has repeatedly made incursions into Japanese territorial waters. The number of incursions has significantly increased since September 2012. Chinese Coast Guard is becoming increasingly militarized. China revised the national police legislation and put the CCZ under the command of the Central Military Committee in June 2020. In February, February 1st this year, Chinese Coast Guard law was enacted and entry into force. This law allows the CCZ to use all necessary means, including the use of weapons against foreign ships. Professor Kanehara will talk more on this later. Chinese, Chinese naval vessels had been conducting operations in the East China Sea actively. A China military online article reported that in recent years, the average number of days in a year that all major combatants in the East Sea Fleet of the Chinese Navy conducted operations exceeded 150 days. Chinese Navy continued to transit the waters near Japan to advance into the Pacific Ocean and return to base with high frequency. Recently, six Chinese Navy ships, including the aircraft carrier Liaoning, transited through between Okinawa and Miyako Islands this April. In 2013, China designated the airspace above the Senkaku Islands 
as the East China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone. The Chinese government claims that any aircraft traveling through this zone must comply with the rules defined by China's Ministry of National Defense and obliges aircraft flying in international airspace. China has been intensifying its maritime activities in other oceans close to China, as you see in the South China Sea. Robson will talk on this later. China claims the so-called nine dotted line or nine dash line and has continued to attempt to unilaterally change the status quo in the South China Sea by force or coercion ever since. That's all for me. Uh, now, I would like to turn it over to the first panelist, uh, Professor Kanehara. Uh, she is going to talk about uh, conjunction of issues of the maritime law and territorial sovereignty uh, for Japan and uh, the Chinese Coast Guard law. Let me prepare uh, her slides. Thank you, Captain Maso. My name is Atsuko Kanehara, Professor of International Law and President of the Japanese Society of International Law. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to James, the Naval War College, and all the organizers. Next. Thank you. My presentation will focus on the conjunction between the issues of maritime law and territorial sovereignty. From the perspective of this conjunction, I will make practical analysis in context on the Coast Guard law of China, CZC. Next. The maritime law problems that Japan has faced more than a decade are Chinese aggressive conduct particularly in Japan's territorial sea surrounding the Senkak Islands. China has frequently dispatched uh, its Coast Guard vessels and even military vessels. Chinese fishermen have also come to Japan's territorial sea and in some cases escorted by China's Coast Guard vessel. The Chinese fishermen suddenly become militias. Regarding the territorial sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands, Japan has taken the position that, based upon both history and international law, the islands doubtlessly belong to Japan, and thus Japan denies an existence of a dispute with China. Then, for the conjunction of these issues, the key task for Japan is to protect its national interests from Chinese behaviors. But the critical point is that Japan should make the task accomplished without undermining in any sense its longstanding position that there is no dispute with China on the sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands. This requirement makes the task really daunting for Japan. Why? And in this regard, CGC comes to under scrutiny. How? Then I will explain this why and this how in this order. Next. Let me explain the meaning of dispute. Dispute is 
international legal parlance that is very different from ordinary language and has been established in the world code of jurisprudence for almost 100 years perfectly in accordance with the legal parlance japan coherently takes the position of existence or non-existence of territorial disputes there is a dispute regarding the takeshima island with korea and there is not a dispute regarding the Senkak Islands with China. No incoherence in Japan's positions. I will pick up the most important requirements, two requirements for an existence of a dispute. First, as, as a dispute is a conflict in law and fact between two rival parties, the differences of opinions need to be officially addressed to each other. Second, the opinions of the both sides should have reasonable grounds in fact and in law. Mere assertions without grounds cannot satisfy the element of different opinions to, for, to form a dispute. Next. For what purposes the legal parlance of dispute is established? If a state is determined as a party to dispute under international law, it has to comply with the obligation of the peaceful settlement of a dispute. Please see Article 2, Paragraph 3 of the United Nations Charter. The second requirement of a dispute is that there should be difference of opinions that have reasonable grounds in fact and in law. Let's imagine suddenly a stranger comes to you and says, both the house and the land are mine and there is a dispute. And so you and I have to resolve this dispute peacefully and to start the negotiation, and if necessary, to go to a court. Could you accept such a request based upon mere assertion without grounds in fact and in law? Definitely no. Roughly speaking, this can explain Japan's position of non-existence of a dispute with China regarding the Senkak Islands. Why is the task daunting for Japan to protect Japan's national interest without undermining in any sense Japan's position of non-existence of a dispute with China? The first element of dispute is difference of official positions that were addressed to each other. To protect its national interests, Japan may take measures at sea in accordance with the United Nations on the, on the Law of the Sea Convention to exclude Chinese vessels from Japan's territorial sea surrounding the Senkak Islands. To justify such measures, Japan will emphasize its territorial sovereignty over the islands. Then, what will happen in this regard? We need to not, we need to that, as if the two countries were looking at a mirror. They conduct in the same way to each other. As a result of a mirror effect, Absolutely, China would insist its territorial sovereignty over the islands as Japan is doing. As a result, the formal opinions of both China and Japan conflict to each other. There might be an existence of a dispute. 
Then, what are the possibilities for Japan in order to counter such situations? Japan, in an extremely prudent manner, has declared its position to directly oppose to that of China. This is a sort of negative attitude policy. In contrast to this, for the following two reasons, Japan should consider a sort of positive attitude policy, which means clear negation of China's sovereignty. Japan should prove that China's claim of sovereignty is solely a mere assertion and that there is no dispute. Considering that China's conduct at uh, first, sorry, first Chinese offensive activities aim at unilaterally changing the status quo even by forcible means, considering the China's conducts that Captain Matsuo and I explained before, nobody would deny that these offensive acts are aggravating the tense situations of the East China Sea. China is taking forcible measures in order to unilaterally change the status quo. It is definitely contrary to the rule of law that has been widely shared as a common value in the world. From a worldwide perspective, for the purpose of contributing to the world order and world peace, Japan should clearly deny any legal effects of Chinese unilateral ambition to change the status quo by its forcible measures. From a bilateral perspective, the second reason for Japan to take a positive stance in combating China's claim is to enable Japan to institute stronger measures at sea against Chinese vessels in Japan's territorial sea surrounding the Senkaku Islands. In this context, the examination of CGC is significant. There has been theoretical criticism on CGC with several points as seen in the slide nine. However, rather, I would like to analyze CGC in context, in a practical and problem solving manner. I will take up actual conducts of China as a context in which we examine CGC. First, under CGC, China's law enforcement and the organs to conduct it are provided for. Thus far, Chinese public vessels persistently chase Japanese fishing boats in the territorial sea surrounding the Senkaku Islands. China insists that Chinese public vessels are discharging their mission of law enforcement. This is because, according to China, the sea areas are Chinese China's territorial seas surrounding the Daoyu Tai, that is, Chinese name of the Senkaku Islands. By a mirror effect, both China and Japan continuously insist their sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands. To bring a breakthrough to this deadlock impasse, no method other than to defeat China's mere assertion of its sovereignty would work. Second, CGC admits the designated organs to take forcible measures against foreign vessels, including foreign public vessels that enjoy under UNCLOS, according to UNCLOS, immunity from being the targets of such measures. 
With strong possibility, Chinese public vessels will take forcible measures against vessels of Japan Coast Guard and even Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. Immediately after Japan's future criticism against China's violation of immunity given to Ch Japanese vessels, as a mirror effect, China would stage the same protest against Japan's measures targeting Chinese public vessels. Here again, to bring a breakthrough to the deadlock impasse, moving beyond the issue of immunity under the law of the sea, the denial of China's sovereignty is indispensable. Japan needs to prove that China's claim of its sovereignty over the Senkaku Island is groundless, both in fact and in law, and therefore it is mere assertion. There is no dispute. China is violating sovereignty of other states, and such a state should not be allowed to enjoy immunity. CCC repeatedly mentions protection of national interest and law enforcement at the same time without clear demarcation between them. For China, both issues come to reality at the same time. This is totally true as a matter of fact. Therefore, lack of recognition of the following fact is really fatal to Japan. Japan is facing irrecoverable infringement on its sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands and even its usurpation China by China and the CGC. Thank you for your kind attention. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you, uh, Professor Kanehara, uh, for an excellent and interest, interesting presentation. Uh, also, I'm looking forward to uh, questions from audience. Our following presentation uh, is the ECS and the SCS, some legal and operational linkages by Dr. McLaughlin. Uh, so, Robson, please. Well, thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. I'll just check that uh, hopefully you can see the um, see the screen there. Okay. Well, good morning all and it's a great pleasure to be uh, here with you uh, this morning or this evening, wherever uh, you may be. And it's a great honour to be on this uh, panel with, um, with Captain Matsuo and with uh, Professor Kanahara. So as... Uh, the moderator indicated, I'll look briefly at the East China Sea and the South China Sea and look for some legal and operational linkages. I'll look first at two points of context, and that is why the date 2049 appears to be quite significant. And just to remind many of you, you'll already, of course, be very aware of this, about the three warfares legal doctrine, uh, and in particular, the legal warfare aspect. And as Professor Kanahara has talked about, and as was discussed yesterday, um, the China Coast Guard law has a role to play in that in that uh, in assessing how that doctrine applies to the East China Sea and South China Sea situation. I'll then look briefly at how the situations link, looking to three things, a little bit of strategy, some law and sequencing. And then I'll have a quick look at how the East China Sea and South China Sea situations might be differentiated, in particular in relation to the presence of garrisons and who the adversary or so-called adversary might be. And then, of course, how the East China Sea and South China Sea situations might be considered similar in terms of legally characterizable risks and the application or the practice of 
lawfare. So the context first, the two key pieces of context I wanted to um, emphasise when looking at the differences and similarities between the East China Sea and the South China Sea are first the significance of the date 2049. Uh, as many of you will be aware, at the 19th uh, National Congress of the CCP in 2017, um, it was made very uh, clear by President Xi that uh, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation needs to be achieved by 2049, which is the 100th anniversary of the Civil War, uh, and that the reunification of China is a condition. And there was specific reference to the reunification uh, of China with Taiwan, and not only Taiwan, also with other outlying uh, claimed Chinese territories. And of course, that reunification was intended to be by peaceful means, but the option of a military uh, or forcible reunification was, was certainly on the table. The second element of context is the three warfares doctrine. And you'll recall that the three warfares uh, apparently in Chinese military doctrine are media or public opinion warfare, um, psychological warfare in particular in relation to uh, targeting foreign decision makers, and the third being legal warfare, which you can see there described in a, in a blog from War on the Rocks as shaping the legal context for Chinese actions, including building the legal justification for Beijing's actions, and that's a very outwardly focused sort of international law focused uh, aspect. But the part that's sometimes forgotten is it also involves using Chinese domestic law to signal China's intentions. And as uh, Professor Kanahara has just talked about, and as was discussed a little yesterday as well, China's Coast Guard law, the recent China's Coast Guard, Chinese Coast Guard law, potentially is an important indicator of that domestic legal signaling by China. So that brings us to how the East China Sea and South China Sea situations could be considered linked. Now, strategically, they are linked in several ways, but the two of interest to uh, us when we're looking at uh, legal issues are first that they form parts of the uh, first island chain, which you can see here. So we have, for example, the Paracels up here in the northern part of the South China Sea, uh, already occupied by China, having been taken from uh, South Vietnam in the, in the 70s. We've got the Spratly Islands down here, of course, the subject of uh, ongoing uh, disputes and ongoing maritime militia and other operations. And also, of course, uh, as the JAG in, uh, described this morning, the subject of a, 20, of a very important 2016 arbitral uh, award. Up here, we have Pratas, which is in the northern part of the South China Sea, uh, at old, actually occupied by Taiwan. Taiwan, of course, also holds a single feature in here the largest feature, Ituaba. And then what we're talking about today, the Senkakus here. Now, these features all form part of the first island chain, but they also form links in the A2AD uh, scheme. So, for example, we know that um, there have been uh, anti-air missiles, anti-surface missiles, and also obviously aircraft uh, and hardened shelters, runways, et cetera, put on some of the features that have been extended in the South China Sea. That's a part in the A2AD link. And we also know that there are uh, interests, or China has interests in the Senkakus area in terms of uh, ensuring passage for the Chinese uh, SSN and SSBN fleet out through the first island chain into the, uh, into the open ocean. How are they linked in terms of uh, legal issues? Well, the first is the nature of the claims. And a key point to remember is that all of the assertions China makes in relation to these claims, in particular, we're thinking about the South China Sea down here, the Spratleys, uh, certainly with Pratas, uh, already with the Paracels and now with the Senkakus, these claims are all based on territorial claims. So down here in the South China Sea, whilst we had the Nine Dash line for a long time, uh, which is, you know, as the arbitral award said, legally inexplicable. China's, in recent times, tended to talk about the four shahs, the four island groups in the South China Sea, which seems to indicate that China's placing a much more territorial emphasis on its claims as opposed to the broad ambit claim that 
that, that was disclosed by the old nine dash line claim. The Senkaku's claim, as uh, Professor Kanahara and uh, Kat Matsuo have talked about, is very much a territorial based claim. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the maritime resources and the maritime claims, the EZs and the territorial sea claims, are important, but they're secondary and they do hinge, it appears, off the uh, assertion of territorial claims as the primary issue of concern for China. The second legal issue. Uh, that links the two situations is, again, as uh, Professor Kanahara has talked about, the use of the maritime militia and fishing vessels as state agents or proxies. And I'll, I'll return to that in a moment. The final thing that possibly, possibly links the East China Sea and the South China Sea in this respect is the idea of campaign sequencing. So if we take the date of 2049 as uh, as you know, it has been expressed to be, which is the sort of the drop dead date for the reunification of all the outlying parts of China, including most significantly Taiwan, then it raises questions about, well, is there a sequence that will be used in order to get to that point? Might there be more activity and more uh, operations to take um, features in the Spratleys, followed by perhaps an operation to take the Pratis Atoll, followed by the Senkakus, followed by Taiwan, or might it be Spratleys followed by Senkakus because the Senkakus are un, uninhabited, whereas the Pratas, of course, is linked to, to Taiwan because it's it's occupied by Taiwan at the moment, has Taiwanese soldiers on it, uh, followed by Taiwan. So there's a series of different ways we can think about that strategic sequencing or campaign sequencing in terms of linking these different features along the first island chain. So how are the situations in East China Sea and the South China Sea potentially different. First of all, if you're thinking of it from a PRC perspective, obviously in the East China Sea, and we're concerned with the Senkakus here, the, the adversary, so to speak, would be Japan. Now, Japan is a very capable state, a very, very capable Coast Guard, a very, very capable uh, self-defence force. And Japan obviously uh, has a very significant alliance, the US alliance. Japan will also want to seek a, a peaceful solution where, or peaceful resolution where possible. In the South China Sea, in the Spratleys area, there are a variety of possible adversaries from a PRC perspective. Thinking about the two perhaps most likely, the Philippines has already sought peaceful resolution by, via dispute resolution. Uh, mechanisms has been rebuffed, as we know, uh, the Chinese response to the 2016 arbitral award has been very clear. Uh, that it ignores the award and that the award may as well not have happened. But of course, there are significant capability differentials between the forces, uh, including the maritime militia that the PRC can bring to bear and that um, that the Philippines can bring to bear in the South China Sea. And that's a very a significant difference between the Senkaku situation and the South China Sea situation. Uh, there's also, of course, ASEAN and US links in the Philippines, uh, in the Philippines um, that, that uh, the Philippines can leverage, um, but whether those links are of the same uh, robust nature as the US-Japan alliance, that's an interesting issue to, to think about. Vietnam, the other possible um, adversary from a PRC perspective in the, in the South China Sea, if it seeks to uh, take over a further or additional features, especially in the Spratleys. Well, we know that Vietnam and the PRC have a history of conflicts, certainly 1974 when the Paracels were taken uh, from South Vietnam, and more, more recently in 1988, the Johnson Reese South uh, operation by the PRC again against Vietnam. But of course, Vietnam also enjoys uh, the, um, the support of ASEAN, but of course, ASEAN has had some challenges in dealing with uh, Chinese maritime operations in the past. The other big or key differentiation point, I think, is the fact that there are uh, boots on the deck in the Spratleys. So there are garrisons on a number of features in the Spratleys, whereas the Senkakus, as was noted previously, are not inhabited. They have been in the past, but they're not inhabited at the moment. So that might have strategic implications. Might um, the PRC seek to uh, exploit the Senkaku situation before the Spratleys because when there's not people there, it reduces the legal risks to an extent. Uh, whereas when there are people involved and then possibly killings and deaths involved, that of course escalates or elevates uh, the legal risks. So it'll be interesting to work out whether they might adopt different approaches 
in terms of using the maritime militia. So in both in both places at the moment, the maritime militia is used, and um, Captain Matsuo and Professor Kanahara have talked about those sorts of operations. But in the next step up, a differentiating point might be in that in the East China Sea, we actually see fisher landings, fisher people landings on the Senkakus, and then the PRC seeks to um, respond, so to so to speak, to uh, Japanese reactions to those landings by fishermen or fisher people on the um, on the Senkakus. Whereas in the South China Sea, we're probably more likely to see activity directly by the CCG in terms of landings rather than by the maritime militia. This also, therefore, paints the potential for different lawfare approaches. In the East China Sea, China might seek to paint the action as being the action of fisher people uh, and needing to protect the fisher people from uh, a Japanese response, whereas in the South China Sea, more likely to see it as a routine China Coast Guard operation in land and sea areas under undoubted by the PRC perspective, uh, undoubted PRC jurisdiction, so there's no dispute, no dispute resolution is necessary. So how are the situations therefore potentially similar? Well, thinking about this eye on Taiwan and by 2049, uh, both the South China Sea and the East China Sea share a strategic uh, commonality, and that is that they offer smaller scale, uh, potentially lower risk proof of concept areas to test operations, uh, including joint warfare capabilities, including lawfare capabilities. But of course, there are legally characterizable risks that come with that uh, when thinking about this from the PRC perspective. And it's important for us to think about those legally characterizable risks because they might offer leverage points for us uh, to use in countering operations. The first is the escalatory legal effect that the that comes when you have people or boots on the deck on some of these features. That's something that is in the South China Sea, but is not currently in the East China Sea because there's no one on the Senkakus. Uh, we need to think about the nature of the alliances and mutual defence agreements that are, that are different as between the East China Sea and the South China Sea. But we also need to think about state responsibility issues because when you think about uh, the law of the sea and sovereignty claims, there's a degree of contestation, and we're seeing that already in the way that China uh, talks about law of the sea and sovereignty issues in the international arena. But when you come to state responsibility issues, there is, of course, the potential for effective countermeasures uh, within, for example, the articles on state responsibility. And noting that those countermeasures themselves can be what would otherwise be an unlawful act, but they're legitimised by the fact that they're a response to an internationally wrongful act. And that'll complicate things for China because, uh, you know, the law is essentially saying that states can use these otherwise unlawful access countermeasures, and that reduces China's ability to uh, leverage the law. The second is that both the South China Sea and the East China Sea offer uh, options for increased use of proxies, and in particular, the maritime militia, as a force multiplier and for waging lawfare. And in particular, I think it'll be interesting to see in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, how um, how significant increased use of the maritime militia and the fishing vessels and the fishing fleet uh, as the initiator or the, provo pro the provoking force element uh, is and whether that is different between the South China Sea and the East China Sea. The maritime militia, of course, will be the subject of the next, uh, the next session, but the key point that we need to think about is that the maritime militia does create very useful legal ambiguities as to the status of the actors and the character of the conduct, and that creates complications for responders. Think about Japan and the East China Sea. Do I, do I characterise fishermen landing on the Senkakus as the private act of fishers and fishing vessels and invoking a law enforcement response, or do I have to think about that as a state act and those people are state agents and the vessels effectively are state vessels, and I need to assess that conduct in terms of state responsibility and uh, use of force responses. So thank you very much for your attention and very happy to uh, share in some questions with my fellow panellists. Uh, thank you, uh, Lob Sal. Uh, another excellent presentation, and I appreciate that you introduced an article by some Japanese author titled by a Chinese Coast Guard Law Challenges Rule Based Order. I wrote the same idea in a column uh, which is posted 
uh, on JMSDF Commander Staff College homepage. So please access to it too. Uh, now, we have a lot of questions thanks to the audience. Uh, let me pick just two uh, of them. Uh, the first question is going to uh, Professor Kanehara's one. Uh, has China ever proposed settling its claims to Senkaku in an international court or tribunal? Uh, would Japan have anything to fear from this, given its confidence in the strength of its own case? Uh, Professor Kanahara, you uh, mentioned uh, the positive attitude policy to solve the problem. Uh, can you address to uh, this question, please? Thank you, Captain Matsuo. Uh, to answer the question, uh, let me uh, repeat uh, some contents of my presentation. Japan has taken the position that there is no dispute with China regarding the sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands. So uh, Japan has no obligation uh, to uh, no obligation or peaceful settlement of a dispute. And so Japan does not go to the court. That is my clear answer, I hope. Thank you very much. And uh, we have, uh, we can pick one more question. Uh, um, okay, this is going to uh, 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 Robson, Professor McLaughlin. Um, Yeah, uh, given uh, the emphasis uh, that the Senkaku are uninhabited, uh, would it be in Japan's interest to situation JSDF or JCC on the various features in the Senkaku to raise the risk associated with the Chinese of occupation of the islands? Uh, Robson, can you uh, answer this question? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, thanks, Pete. Um, yes, uh, is the short answer. I think that's that's a very, very um, significant way for Japan to signal uh, its step up in, you know, protective intent, so to speak. But as I as I noted, which I think is something you, you, you're picking up on, when you put people on features, uh, it escalates the legal. Um, complications that any adversary who wants to take the feature will face because, of course, the moment you've got boots on the deck and then you have to use force in order to remove those boots on the deck, the potential for uh, loss of life or destruction of um, sovereign property escalates uh, very significantly. And that can then transcend the argument or the the, 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 the legal characterization of the issue out of the realm of perhaps just, you know, general run-of-the-mill law enforcement dealing with recalcitrant fishermen uh, into something that's much more uh, significant, much more sovereign, and needs to be dealt with in terms of, you know, state responsibility and the law around use of force. So I think that that would definitely provide a uh, dissuasive effect. But, you know, coming, what comes with that, of course, is if the adversary is, uh, as you know, if the adversary is determined, then it also increases the cost, uh, you know, when we assume that they, they're going to uh, take or occupy the islands, whatever whatever might be before them. Okay. Okay. Uh... Let me thank uh, our panelists uh, for uh, your excellent presentations and discussion. And uh, uh, thank you uh, to the audience uh, for listening to us. Uh, without your support, we couldn't do much for this conference. Now I will turn it back to the Secretariat. Uh, we ran out, of, ran out of our time in our session. Uh, thank you very much. and. Uh, Good evening. Thank you very much, Captain Matsuo, Professor Kanahara, and Professor McLaughlin. What a great discussion. And also a big thank you to the audience for engaging with such great questions. It is certainly a complex issue. Um, we are trying to stay on schedule, so we will take a 10-minute break. We are at minute 15 and we will reconvene with session six, gray zones, maritime militias, 
at minute 25. So see you all back here in 10 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. We are now starting session six, Gray Zones, Maritime Militias. So first we have our moderator, Dr. Hitoshi Nasu, Professor of International Law, University of Exeter. We have our two panelists, Dr. Lai Tai Bin, Deputy Director General, East Sea South China Sea Institute, Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, and Professor Jay Batong Bacall, Executive Associate Dean, University of the Philippines College of Law. So I will turn it over to Dr. Nasu to open, and then we will play two pre-recorded remarks from both our panelists, and then we will open for live questions and answers. So Dr. Nasu, over to you. Thanks, Pam. And welcome everyone to this great zone and maritime militia session. It's a real privilege to be involved in this important session as a chair to facilitate a discussion on one of the most pressing maritime security, security challenges we are facing today. In this panel, we explore various strategic and legal issues arising from the presence and activities of maritime militia and so-called gray zone situation created as a result. And we have two highly qualified experts joining us uh, from Southeast Asia to present regional perspectives on this issue. Dr. Lai Tai Bin from Vietnam and Professor Jai Batombakal from the Philippines. The issue of maritime militia is nothing new. For China, maritime militia played a critical role in establishing an organized means to defend its coastal waters when their naval capabilities were still underdeveloped. Their role has changed over the course of the years, however, making significant contributions to establishing presence in areas where sovereignty and maritime claims are disputed. A classic example is their involvement in the seizure of the Paracel Islands in January 1974, where Chinese fishing vessels played a critical role in slowing down Vietnam's response to counter the offensive campaigns. Nowadays, maritime militia are instrumental to China's maritime strategy in challenging other states' ability to maintain control over disputed areas, posing a threat to regional stability. Their operation in the East China Sea has caused tensions with Japan, as we just heard from the previous panel, in challenging Japan's control over the Senkaku Island and the surrounding waters. And more recently, as we all know, maritime uh, militia vessels have been maintaining their presence in the West Philippine Sea over the Whitson Reef. This latest incident reminds us of the standoff uh, over the Scarborough Shoal that took place in April 2012 and the continued Chinese presence since then. These activities by maritime militia raise various strategic and legal issues due to the so-called gray zone situation, whereby traditional boundaries between peacetime law enforcement and wartime military operations are deliberately blurred. For example, there's an issue regarding how maritime militia and their operations should be legally characterized and what response options are available and effective against them. We may also need to think about the possibility of responding in kind as Vietnam has started doing by forming and deploying maritime militia to protect or advance sovereign interests in disputed borders. Or should we perhaps reconsider the traditional threshold of a forceful or an escalatory response against the routine employment of irregular forces in gray zone operations in the South China Sea? These are some of the questions we would explore in this panel. So on that note, let me now introduce our first speaker of this panel, Dr. Lai Tai Bin. Dr. Lai is Deputy Director General of the East Sea Institute at the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. In his diplomatic career, he took various posts in the American division of the Vietnamese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
to facilitate US-Vietnam relations. Dr. Lai has also been involved in various research projects on US-Vietnam relations. And in his presentation, Dr. Lai will discuss what gray zone activities are and assess China's maritime military activities conducted in the South China Sea. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this very important forum about the uh, gray zone strategy and uh, maritime militia. And uh, first of all, let me uh, share with you my thoughts on the definition of this concept. Um, the gray zone strategy uh, has a long history, as you know, and is usually used in military strategy. This concept has been emerging in policy debate in recent years to describe revisionist powers. And I think that gray zone is a very popular Western concept to characterize the South China Sea disputes, or especially the China's action in the South China Sea. But on the other hand, the Chinese leaders don't use the term gray zone. In China's perspective, their tactics of using paranormal forces like the Coast Guard and the militia allow them to find an optimal balance between maritime rights protection and stability maintenance. Prior naval forces are much less provocative than warships, and these tactics might originate from the art of war by Shenzhou winning without fighting. As far as I understand as a scholar, there are some main characteristics of gray zone. First, ambiguity. Gray zone is a state between peacetime and an emergency situation. And it is based on different interpretation of rules, norms, and laws. Second, asymmetry. Talking about capability asymmetry, with a smaller, it is not necessary for the challengers to resort to military forces. Talking about interest asymmetry, the smaller with independent ties might not dare to accepting risk of prevailing war with the challenger. And third, incrementalism. The challenger do not resort to direct and sizable with the force. Instead, they are taking incremental actions that are not likely to provoke a military response. Here, I'd like to refer to the situation like the salami slicing or the cabbage peeling. In recent years, gray zones are being used to usually describe the South China Sea disputes, in which low intensified conflicts usually take place and parties employ non military or paramilitary zones and forces. China has been described as a party that employ gray zone operations most frequently in the South China Sea and employ maritime militia as one of the gray zone forces, which can be comprised of maritime law enforcement forces, maritime militia, and fishermen. China's maritime militia fits in as a gray zone force that operates below the first hole of war. Talking about ambiguity, the maritime militia has an ambiguous nature. Their status is civilian force, but actually they have connection with the government and under command of the Chinese military. And it is difficult to differentiate maritime militia from traditional fishing activities. Most of the maritime militia vessels operate on high seas and are usually engaged in commercial fishing, but occasionally are called on to assist the China's Navy or China's Coast Guard. Talking about the exploitation of asymmetry, with maritime militia, 
China can therefore maintain a fast network of forward maritime observers and sheer volume of vessels that are in the first line of offshore defense without using naval forces. And because of their cheap fishing vessels, we always outnumber the warships. Talking about the incrementalism, the vastness of the fishing fleet of force of the Chinese with a force that can maintain a persistent presence near contested islands and fishers, allowing for the gradual acceptance by the international community of Chinese sovereignty. And, uh, you know, looking at history, we have seen some incidents involving China's maritime militia. Maritime militia ships led the charge when Beijing occupied the mischief reef in the Spratly Islands in 1984. In 2012, militia fishing vessels again led the charge for Beijing's occupation of the Scarborough shore. In 2014, during the oil rig incident, China carried out the cabbage strategy to protect the oil rig. This included 35 to 40 Coast Guard vessels, 30 transport ships and tugboats, 35 to 40 fishing vessels, and four naval ships. Ships of the maritime militia have also been used to trespass into territorial waters around the Central Islands. And the project eliminating the South China Sea's net fishing fleet concluded that a different kind of fishing fleet, one engaged in paramilitary work on behalf of the state rather than the commercial enterprise of fishing, has emerged as the largest force in the spread leaf. The number of militia vessels operating in the area on behalf of China is much larger and more persistent than is generally understood. And most recently, the recent reef incident. In March, the Philippines formally protested the presence of about 200 Chinese posts more near the claim recent reef in the South China Sea. And I do agree with some uh, scholars saying that the recent reef incident is unprecedented in scale and notable for its duration. The largest number of Chinese fishing vessels gathered at any time at one spread the reef and staying there for several weeks. Therefore, I'd like to have some recommendation for the smaller countries with a symmetric disadvantage in the gray zone conflict. First of all, we should have greater transparency at sea, like the maritime security information sharing. Second, we should pay attention to cover legal warfare. It means we should consider taking the legal proceeding as a deterrent tool and enhancing rules-based order. And third, Information warfare is very important in understanding the situation and how to solve the gray zone uh, situation. And last but not least, smaller countries should consider tightening partnerships with other countries in order to deal with the gray zone tactics or strategy and the maritime militia effectively, especially in, in enhancing capacity building and training with other countries. So, thank you very much for listening to me, and I am very happy to have further discussion with you on this important topic. Thank you very much. Good day to everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this prestigious conference. I was originally scheduled to be at the Naval War College last year, but unfortunately the pandemic aborted all flights and shattered all my travel plans. Hopefully, I will still get another chance to visit Rhode Island when things get back to more or less normal. Coping with jet lag by walking around and seeing new places certainly beats uh, coping with insomnia by raiding the refrigerator in the kitchen. 
Now, as we're talking about China's gray zone tactics in the South China Sea, China appears to have obliged the conference this year with an ongoing demonstration. Since March 2021, the Chinese maritime militia has been the focus of attention of the Philippine Maritime Services and the wider Philippine public. The government's revelation that 220 Chinese maritime militia vessels were anchored and lashed together at Whitson Reef, only 175 nautical miles from the nearest shore in the Philippines, and within the highly contested Spratly Islands region last uh, March, sparked a major sustained furor that stands in very, very stark contrast to five years of downplaying and glossing over other incidents of utter disregard for Philippine jurisdiction vindicated by the 2016 South China Sea arbitration. While domestic politics, in view of the fact that the next presidential election is just 12 months away, uh, may certainly be playing a role uh, in the public posturing of many government officials, it also cannot be denied that public pressure has long been building up against the Duterte administration over its accommodation of China at every turn. Furthermore, these latest incidents cast a light upon an overlooked aspect of China's strategy for taking control of the South China Sea by waging a veritable protracted people's war, a maritime insurgency, to, so to speak, that pits ostensibly civilian fleets against the armed services of its rivals. Whether the Philippines have legal basis and right to demand the dispersal of the CMM fleet anchored at Whitson Reef has been raised by uh, various commentators. Such legal analysis is not unreasonable given the complications of the geographical setting and the inherent limitations and loopholes of the South China Sea Arbitration Award and UNCLOS. Whitson Reef stands at a legal nexus. On one hand, it is physically located within 200 nautical miles of the Philippines and therefore within its EEZ and continental shelf, but it is also within 12 nautical miles of Chinese-occupied Mackinnon Reef, which was recognized by the South China Sea Arbitra Arbitration Tribunal as a high tide elevation, and Vietnamese-occupied um, Grierson Reef, which was not similarly recognized, however. In the absence of an actual delineation and delimitation of any maritime boundaries, the status of the waters and seabed of Whitson Reef itself is technically still unsettled. The legal issue that commentators try to address is whether it is legal for the Chinese fishing vessels to anchor in that disputed location, and conversely, whether it's legal for the Philippines to actually uh, make an issue out of it. Now, anchoring in the high seas could be perceived as uh, coinciding with the, with the exercise of freedom of navigation. But this kind of an answer would actually decontextualize the situation and get China off the hook or what, is actually, what it's actually doing in the South China Sea. One must not forget that China's activities in the South China Sea are part of a broader strategy to establish de facto administration and control of that area. Thus, the incident at Whitson Reef should not be seen as isolated from this broader purpose. Now, the Chinese embassy in the Philippines admitted that such vessels were fishing, albeit sheltering from supposedly bad weather or sea conditions. Apparently, clear sunny weather is something that they do not welcome. Anyway, in other words, they were allegedly taking a pause from a longer term activity, fishing within the Philippine EEZ, which surrounds Whitson Reef. So this anchoring is not part of the exercise of freedom of navigation. It is actually part of fishing operations, or it is a fishing operation. And fishing operations have already been adjudged to be in violation of the Philippines' sovereign rights under UNCLOS if they're being conducted by China uh, within its Philippine, within the EEZ. Now, so context changes everything. And this is an interesting example of how China's sali salami slicing or cabbage strategy seems to have also infected the legal field. It has become very easy, practically second nature, to similarly salami slice the legal issues in a way that makes it easy to hesitate and question the correctness of a position once isolated from its factual environment. But there's more. What started the Philippine government uh, on this appears to be the sheer spectacle of a massive number of silent fishing vessels lashed together on Whitson Reef. Suspicions were raised that the CMM was preparing to carry out something other than fishing either to deploy the foundation of another structure, like what they did back in 1995 you know, on Mr. Free, 
or to prepare Whitson Reef for rapid destruction and reclamation. To date, no evidence has been cited of either foundations being laid or dredging ships being deployed and operated. But this does not diminish the possibility that China is already doing something else and that is occupying the reef without evidence of occupation. Traditionally, occupation in the Spratly Islands has been carried out by building fixed structures. But the 2002 Declaration of Conduct, which China officially subscribes to, prohibits the construction of new facilities on features that were already occupied in 2002. The CMM deployment at Whitson Reef, however, clearly points to a way around this. By making Whitson Reef an anchorage site for this massive fleet, China is basically establishing a continuous presence without having to build anything. Lashing that many ships together in a line is an uncommon practice in the open sea, but is often seen in the congested ports of Southeast Asia and China. Mariners question the, practic the practicality of this move as a response to bad weather and sea conditions. Thus, this is definitely not for the purpose of safe navigation. But thinking out of the box reveals that this is ideal for one thing, giving the crews a larger space to move about and interact in, and, by, and thereby also assembling a floating island that remains in a fixed position for extended periods of time. This is halfway through to occupation and possession de facto of the reef. Possession legally is comprised of two elements. One, the use and benefit of something, and two, the exclusion of everyone else from that benefit and from that thing. This is the situation established by China in 2012 on Scarborough Shoal, resulting in the Philippines' loss of control of that reef. So here on Whitson Reef, you have a use and benefit. But the second element, exclusion, does not appear to have been done yet or does not appear to have emerged yet, but there have been precursors, okay? In 2017, warning shots were reportedly filed, fired against Filipino fishermen in the vicinity of Whitson Reef, well, in Union Banks, in at least five separate incidents, which have discouraged the fishermen from returning, okay? So if it's been done before, it can be done again. So it is not far-fetched to think that the threat of a new occupation actually is quite real. The CMM fleet at Whitson Reef dispersed nearly three weeks after their initial discovery, likely to avoid further scrutiny by Philippine maritime and air patrols as well as, as, well as the, to avoid the tension of the world. A large bulk of the fleet apparently took shelter outside the Philippine EZ but others spread out to other Chinese-occupied reefs. Since then, it has been a running chase as Philippine air and maritime units up their patrols, seemingly bouncing back from five years of having to be checked from venturing out into the EEZ. Two weeks ago, a smaller group of vessels anchored in a similar fashion at Sabina Shoal, 79 nautical miles from the mainland of Palawan. This was dispersed by the Philippine Coast Guard. This week, China seems to have bounced back, you know? from the initial shock of the Philippine response, and it has deployed reportedly 287 CMM ships, you know, at least 287, and they're distributed in smaller numbers across all features in the South China Sea. The purpose most likely is to wear out the Philippines resistance, knowing fully well that the country, this small country, has very limited resources to support continuing patrol presence probably also to convince the Philippines of the futility of confronting so many Chinese ships and interfering with so many Chinese activities across the West Philippine Sea. Now, CMM vessels in the Philippine EZ don't often fish. That much is known. Investigations by Andrew Erickson and Ryan Martinson and, and CSIS uh, with uh, Greg Pauling have revealed a patrol pattern in their AIS tracks and raises the possibility of even more um, closely observing and gaining insight about the operations of this fleet. Uh, these studies can also shed light on the real fishing operations of ships that are not as deeply involved as the active militia members. And though the evidence may be a bit thin and requires better data, there seems to be some indication that the public pushback somewhat works. Comparison of various nighttime data displaying fishing vessel detections seem to support the hypothesis that strong public policy uh, postures 
uh, best result in what we assume to be for what we assume to be real fishing vessels being discouraged from venturing into the Philippine EEZ. In 2017 and 2018, the Philippine government took a very soft and accommodating attitude towards Chinese fishing vessels in the CMM, but this began changing in 2019 when the DFA called out the persistent CMM operations around the Kalan Island Group. Now, last year and this past March, a significant number of foreign fishing vessel detections are clearly respecting somewhat the 200 nautical mile line of the Philippine EZ. So despite the modest impact, thinning this ma these massive numbers of Chinese fishing vessels in the Philippine EZ to any measurable degree is certainly an improvement, but it just simply boggles the mind why thousands of large steel hulled fishing vessels should be assembled and deployed so recklessly across the entire South China Sea. The ecological and environmental impact of such a concentration catch effort in an already stagnating fishery area simply does not make sense unless such deployment is, a for, is for a totally different purpose unrelated to any kind of reasonable and sustained fishing uh, food production. Now, so if anything, this year's incident at Whitson Reef casts a much needed spotlight upon China's maritime insurgency against the South China Sea arbitration UNCLOS, and the regional and global legal order. It is something that is worth discussing and observing, as it likely signals the next phase in China's incremental and gray zone takeover of this mar vital maritime area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. So um, we have about 20 minutes or so uh, for Q&I. And so if you have any questions, um, uh, please um, feel free to post your questions on a Q&A box. Uh, while we are waiting for more questions, there are already some questions some, um, uh, they, the audience wants to address. So um, um, can I ask Dr. Lai and Professor Batombako uh, to be ready on the screen? Yes, yes, of course. Thank hmm. you. So um, um, you uh, talked about some of the options that are available to uh, the states in the region. Uh, for example, um, Dr. Lai talked about the possible judicial proceedings uh, that can be brought against China. And um, uh, Professor Batombako uh, talked about a persistent public uh, um, response and protest uh, against China. What do you think about the more forcible option um, should we, one of the questions is that uh, should we now characterize uh, such um, uh, maritime militia activities as amounting to use of force, uh, which could justify a more forcible response uh, from uh, countries like the Philippines and Vietnam? Do you have any thought on that? Let's start with Professor Bakonga Bakao because he's already um, on the screen. Yes, yes, uh, thank you, thank you. Yes, that's a very good question and it's it's really uh, a very, uh, um, th the problem we, we face is that it can be a rather slippery slope. Earlier, one of the questions raised was, is it possible to distinguish between the CMM vessels and real fishing vessels? And of course, it's very difficult. There are some ways to do it. You can identify perhaps a few that are clearly uh, maritime militia vessels based on their history of behavior. But the thing is, there are thousands of them. And so it is easy to make a mistake uh, at this point, uh, unless we come up with better means of identifying and distinguishing. And so because, just because of that, uh, I'm not yet ready uh, to um, advocate um, um, making, uh, taking that step. No? Uh, but uh, the sh short of that, it is possible to at least make a public uh, statement or declaration which uh, clearly attributes to, say, China or the, the flag state no? uh, the, um, this behavior uh, undertaken by these vessels, which appear to be maritime militia vessels. No? Uh, and that, I think, ha does have some kind of uh, effect as well. No? The fact that you will treat them as uh, essentially agents of the state, no? Uh, would uh, be could be a factor in how you then uh, proceed with your diplomacy, and uh, if there is going to be an incident, um, then 
the onus, uh, the responsibility clearly uh, can be laid on their, uh, on that side, on their side rather than than yours. No? And, and that I think is uh, one way to uh, address this uh, situation. Uh, back in 2019, for example, the Philippine government um, uh, through the DFA came up with an, unus an unusual statement. Uh, basically calling out the maritime militia vessels that were surrounding Pagasa Island at the time, uh, one of the islands in this practice. Uh, and they made a rather innocuous statement saying that if China does not um, um, do anything about it, it is deemed to have condoned the activities of those vessels, which were already called out, which were called out by the DFA as, as uh, being uh, destabilizing and creating um, security issues. Uh, so I think that's that's one good step uh, that can be taken um, uh, for now, no? and then we can see what what uh, what can be done uh, later if the activities of these vessels become more uh, serious. Thank you, Professor Patombako. and Dr. Lai. Um, Vietnam seems to be taking perhaps a different response, and um, as I understand it, that Vietnam has also started forming. Uh, maritime militia as a possible uh, response to this. So um, uh, do you have any thought about which options or forcible options, um, either by traditional uh, conventional forces uh, or um, uh, militia type forces uh, may be effective from, uh, to challenge China's aggressive behavior? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it is a very interesting question and uh, it is also a hard question. And um, uh, I think that uh, both options are not enough in order to counter uh, the so-called, you know, maritime militia uh, forces from China. Uh, and uh, as I said in my uh, presentation uh, in China, they, they do not, you know, recognize the term maritime militia. They do have the militia forces by law and um, uh, let me explain a little bit uh, because I saw one question before. Uh, um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, in general, the uh, militia forces uh, in China are governed both by the, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the local authorities and by the uh, uh, military agencies from the central government. And uh, so, uh, so it's very hard in order to, and it's very hard in order to differentiate, you know, like uh, 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 militia vessels and the civilian vessels, which uh, makes it harder for all of us in order to counter the maritime militia, the so-called maritime militias, as we usually call it, uh, when there when there are incidents at sea. And uh, for the, uh, of course, I think that the uh, conventional forces, not only of Vietnam, but also of other countries are always ready for emergency situation in the sea. But uh, you know that all countries try to avoid, you know, using the uh, uh, conventional forces, the military, uh, the conventional military forces in order to deal with, you know, uh, such incidents at sea, because it might provoke uh, a very dangerous situation in the South China Sea or in any other seas. And uh, for the uh, for our maritime militia forces, uh, we are very different from China. Uh, you can recall in the uh, in my presentation that one of the characteristics of the uh, of the uh, gray zone tactics, gray zone operations, and the uh, maritime militia uh, forces of China. Uh, is the uh, asymmetry. Uh, so asymmetry means uh, it's only meaningful to you know the bigger country to have you know such such forces for the uh, maritime militia, the so-called maritime militia of Vietnam. Uh, we do not have the uh, we, we have you know very different function and capabilities. So. Uh, we don't pose any threats to any countries in the region, and uh, and uh, basically we are very you know defensive, uh, and 
<laughs> and you know, I I think that is uh, is impossible in order to use uh, the uh, Vietnamese American militia forces in order to counter with uh, you know China's uh, the so-called uh, China's maritime militia forces. So it's a very hard question, and uh, and I think that here uh, I think that we need a very different solution, a very comprehensive uh, and uh, international solution in order to, you know, solve the issues I see uh, that might, uh, uh, you know, uh, rise out of the so-called maritime militia from China. Thank you. So um, um, now some of the audience are uh, asking um, some of the technical aspects of a possible response options, uh, particularly in identifying uh, which uh, vessels uh, can be uh, a legitimate uh, fishing vessels uh, and which ones are not. Um, so um, um, uh, Professor Bakambokal, I think um, um, Philippines actually has an experience of um, um, uh, bringing some effort to prosecute some of those Chinese um, uh, fish, uh, fishing uh, fishers, uh, fishermen. So, um, uh, but perhaps it didn't go well. Uh, perhaps, you, perhaps, perhaps you could talk about uh, and share with us some, uh, some of the experiences the Philippines has been um, uh, making um, in um, prosecuting or in making law enforcement action against those vessels. Yes, yes. Um, indeed, there have been instances where the Philippines did actually apprehend uh, Chinese fishers uh, conducting fishing operations, uh, um, especially those close to Palawan, basically the mainland. Uh, and during the Aquino administration, it even occurred while the arbitration was pending and we uh, found um, the, the Philippines arrested a, fishing a Chinese fishing vessel with 500 marine turtles on board. Um, um, and uh, the incident in Scarborough Shoal, in fact, uh, started with the Philippines trying to arrest uh, Chinese uh, fishermen on Scarborough Shoal, um, extracting uh, giant clams and thereby destroying the coral reef. Um, before, um, well, from the late 1990s up to the 20, early 2010s, up to 2012, uh, there were efforts uh, um, to do so. So there were instances of fishermen being apprehended and tried and convicted. But during this time also, the uh, policy of the uh, executive uh, was uh, a bit accommodating as well to China, you know? especially early, uh, late 1990s. There, was, there were always um, diplomatic representations being made by the Chinese embassy, which led to these fishermen being uh, um, acquitted or, or charges not uh, being dropped. Um, now, the current administration, the Duterte administration, does not have an appetite for prosecuting um, Chinese fishermen. Um, but, um, well, this year, well, at least the past three weeks, there have been, um, um, it has been making overtures that that uh, the Chinese fishing should stop. No? Um, but I don't see any real um, improvement in the current administration's posture towards uh, Chinese fishermen, at least for the near future, no? until it uh, is um, until the administration is replaced uh, by presidential elections next year. May, maybe then we'll see some change, assuming that the next administration takes a totally different uh, posture from the current one. Thank you, Professor Patombako and Dr. Lai. Uh, do you think the Vietnam might take a sort of similar steps and, uh, in trying to uh, use the law enforcement um, uh, mechanisms to uh, deal with the um, uh, fishing vessels? Uh, actually, we are open to own options. But uh, as I said before, uh, this issue is quite difficult. So Vietnam should be very careful in, uh, before we. Uh, uh, have you know further decisions and steps? Mm. Okay. Um, and um, uh, the other question is about the public opinion. So, um, um, uh, given that the China's um, uh, interest is engaging in sort of a lawfare, uh, using law and public uh, relations, and um, um, 
Do you think that there may be some scope? Uh, well, uh, Professor Bakambako uh, talked about a certain effectiveness, certain degree of effectiveness uh, in making persistent uh, public uh, protests uh, and taking pictures and in disseminating their images. Um, mm. Do you think that would be an um, uh, effective way or that may be perhaps a uh, limited option some uh, the countries have? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's effective on two levels. One is on, in terms of domestic uh, awareness. Um, it was the, the fact that uh, this incident happened the past week no? and you had uh, such imagery. I mean, the, the, the pictures of these vessels really galvanized public opinion. And so uh, unlike in previous years, this time there's really been a, a lot of interest a lot of uh, statements being issued by many different sectors, including the business sector, calling on the government to take a stronger stand against uh, uh, China and its fishing operations in the Philippine Sea. On an international level, I think um, exposing these operations uh, is one way of uh, deterring them from achieving their objectives, no? because um, I believe that the fact that attention was focused on the fleet at Whitsun Reef led to it being dispersed. So whatever um, objective they had in doing so, uh, in a way, was probably neutralized by, by that. No? And so having inter international, well, having international communities eyes on them, on these militia operations, uh, I, I believe does discourage them from pushing through with uh, particular uh, objectives. But that requires, uh, however, that this, this uh, attention be really trained on them at the right time. Um, the, the, I, the, these militia operations work because they're able to establish, uh, they're able to create a fight accompli. You know? They've been able to, to achieve their objectives. And then the fact that they're, they, they take place in isolated areas far from, from uh, the public eye you know, is what helps them, what lets them become uh, so effective. You know? they're able to control the flow of information and therefore shape the narratives around the incident afterwards. No? But if, uh, if they're immediately exposed, then it much, becomes much more difficult for them to, to control that narrative and therefore that um, neutralizes to a certain extent the effectiveness of these uh, gray zone uh, operations. Thank you. Um, the questions from the audience have sort of disappeared <laughs> from my screen. So uh, let me pose some, uh, perhaps the last final question uh, to both of you uh, to address. Um, well, we have been talking about challenges, but uh, when there's a challenge, uh, there's always an opportunity as well. So what sort of op strategic opportunity do you see um, in uh, meeting these challenges that are posed uh, by the uh, presence and activities of um, uh, mar uh, maritime militia activities? Let's start with Dr. Lai. Uh, you know, uh, as I said many times from my presentation, and we also heard from my colleagues from the Philippines, uh, it's hard in order to deal with the uh, gray zone uh, operation and tactics and the maritime militia. And, uh, you know, uh, gray zone tactics uh, and uh, maritime militias are not new. But uh, actually, I I strongly believe that uh, uh, it is not very uh, common, you know, issues from the from even from the Western, you know, perspective, and uh, so I think that uh, uh, it's hard, you know, to solve this problem, you know, by any single uh, solution. Uh, in the meantime, that uh, awareness, even in the Western countries, uh, uh, you know. I, I, I don't, don't think that uh, is strong enough uh, regard, regarding this issue. And so I think that uh, we need a very total solutions and uh, uh, including but not limited to, you know, the, uh, 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 the transparency in the South China Sea, the, uh, you know, like information sharing uh, and a lot of things that uh, uh, Professor Patumba can just uh, mention. And... Uh, and uh, and I think that we should be very flexible, and uh, and uh, sometimes you know we should combine a lot of efforts, uh, not only uh, the information sharing, but also the we sh should make 
it more clear uh, with the even with the international laws and norms with to certain activities in the in the in the sea, not only the South China Sea, uh, but also maybe the Senkaku, uh, uh, the uh, the East uh, uh, China Sea, and uh, I think that uh, we, we we need more regulation and laws, and we need to we need to have you know. Uh, better coordination among the countries, and I believe that only you know combined solution and efforts can be able to you know address uh, this issue and solve this issue more effectively. Thank you, Dr. Lai. So there are quite a lot of um, opportunities we can see. Um, Professor Patamboko, uh, you have the final words um, uh, on uh, strategic opportunities you see from the Philippines' perspective. Well, I think uh, I agree with Dr. Lai that the strategic opportunities here are in terms of information sharing because one way to really combat this is by enhancing maritime domain awareness. Uh, awareness of uh, the presence of these uh, CMM fleet and their operations is key. We need to look at it as uh, not your traditional naval battle, but as, as I mentioned, it's, an, it's like an insurgency. And I think uh, we probably need to draw uh, lessons from anti-insurgency campaigns uh, on this. Uh, information on the activities of the insurgents, uh, in this case, the maritime militia is, is very important. And anticipating uh, the, the operations and objectives uh, is, uh, is um, key. And that can be gleaned from, from these uh, operations. And then constant awareness, of course, uh, and exposing their operations is, is the other is the other uh, factor. No, uh, these can have uh, deterring uh, deterrent effects. No, uh, and and then um, and lastly would be I, I guess if it towards the end of the line, that's when you can uh, consider now the questions of attribution of the operations of these supposedly civilian vessels to government uh, to the state. No, and and by uh, by establishing that that link, no, and and announcing that there is a link, no, uh, that then uh, could cause uh, China this, and the state uh, that controls this to uh, reconsider uh, its behavior. And uh, of course, we don't want it. But if it does come to the point where an armed conflict, even a limited armed conflict, might occur, then uh, that's when um, the, the implications of attribution. Uh, uh, in an in an armed conflict scenario, can also be considered, no. And so, making a clear uh, policy decision on that, no, I think would help towards uh, deterring uh, these activities, no, and making uh, the flag state more careful and and more restrained, no, uh, in using them uh, in this uh, in, in this arena. Thank you. Thank you very much. And certainly the um, uh, issue of characterization um, in situations of armed conflict is certainly a challenge, perhaps an issue that we didn't have time to address um, uh, in this panel. But the um, uh, learned audience um, uh, would, should be aware that the, um, there's a very um, uh, excellent uh, uh, article uh, written by um, uh, Professor James Kraska. Uh, and published in International Law Studies um, about this exact topic on the legal status of um, uh, maritime militia in situations of armed conflict. So um, um, I'm sure that the, the people uh, would um, uh, revisit uh, that article in to, uh, thinking about uh, this exact question. So thank you very much. It's, um, I'm aware that this is a very late night um, uh, in, um, uh, in Asia. Uh, so thank you very much for being uh, up uh, late, so, uh, late at night. And I will hand back over to you, Pam. Thank you, Dr. Nasu. And thank you so much too, to Dr. Lai and Dr. Batang Bakal. What a great discussion. Um, as they say, gray zone of warfare and gray zone of law. Um, and this, we've got quite a few questions. So appreciate you answering them and enriching us with this great discussion. So again, as Dr. Nasu said, thank you for joining us so late. Um, and this now ends session six, Gray Zones Maritime Militias, and we will take a intermission. So we will return at minute 45, so 1345 Eastern time, and hope to see you all back then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you, Jay. See you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good night. <laughs> Thank Good you. Night. See you soon. Okay. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone, to day two of the Alexander Cushing International Law Conference. So we will open now with session seven on Indian Ocean Maritime Security. And I have the great honor of introducing our moderator and two panelists. For our moderator today, we have Rear Admiral Sudarshan Shukrande, Indian Navy retired, adjunct professor, Indian Naval War College. And we have Mish Darshana Barua, associate fellow, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and Dr. Anruta Rajput, member UN International Law Commission. And you can find their detailed bios in the conference program. Amal Shrikande, over to you to open. Thank you. Thank you, Commander Pamli. Uh, good day to the audiences in the United States and elsewhere in the world. And while I'm about to begin a middle watch in Goa, uh, uh, India, my co-panelist, Ms. Darshana Barua, is in Washington, D.C., and Dr. Anirudh Rajpo joins us from the United Nations in Geneva. It's a, a great privilege for me to be back at Newport and to the Naval War College, even if only virtually, for the first time after graduating with the CNW class of 2003. I learned a great deal in that one year, and I've tried to keep building on what I studied there through the learning that teaching OVEL enables us to do. I must confess, thinking that the conference and the road on which the Naval War College is officially located were both named after the eponymous US Civil War hero, Alexander Cushing. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I didn't know that there was a Navy tag officer uh, also with the surname Cushing, Alexander Cushing, at a critical time for the United States and the world in the Second World War. It underscores two obvious matters. As seamen, we need to know the law and its application in times of peace. In conflict, we need a good grasp of the laws of armed conflict and the room for maneuver and interpretations that any side could apply. In this session, my co-panelist, Ms. Barua, presents a geostrategic review of the state of play in the Indo-Pacific including non-traditional security issues in the Iowa, emerging partnerships like the Quad and the earlier ones like the IORA and the IONS, that is the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and the Indian Ocean Regional Association. Dr. Rajput examines existing frameworks of UNCLOS, other measures and regional arrangements, maritime terrorism, and the Suwa Convention. In the next 10 minutes, I propose to say, stay closer to the issues of international law, specifically how concerns raised for all by China today, but especially for the United States and India, have a not so distant illustration from the 18th century. Let's briefly look at how Britain and the East India Company brought similar concerns for a partially colonized India and a more colonized America. In the 1760s, Robert Clive and the rapacious East India Company were not yet quite colonial masters of India. There was a lot of fighting, coalition building, and alliance disruptions ahead, even as the ideas of Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine were capturing the imagination of America. In India, these urgings were a few decades away when the East India Company consolidated power and became the first private corporation had built its own empire. India's colonization was the British, was with the EIC as an instrument, unlike the more crown-led colonization of American colonies. The larger concerns in the 18th century were, of course, geopolitical and geostrategic, because Mughal rulers, sultans, and rajas in India were skillfully outmaneuvered by the British East India Company, where trade and the trade did precede the flag, but later on worked simultaneously. Here is the American connection I would like to reiterate. The company's export of opium to China and imports of tea to India are, of course, well known in India. Less known are the East India Company's exports, not only of tea, but several uh, other possible goods to the American colonies. The British Crown, of course, having done 
much of the nasty work of conquest, rule, and taxation, unlike what the quote unquote poor East India Company had to endure with much lesser help from the Crown in India, at least in the initial years. But it raised alarms all right in the American, in the 13 American colonies. William Dalrymple puts it well, and I quote, one of the principal fears of the American patriots in the run-up to the war was that Parliament would unleash the East India Company in the Americas to loot as it had done in India. In a few decades from then, the East India Company, to quote Dalrymple again, and I quote, it controlled almost half the world's trade. And as Edmund Burke famously put it, a state, as a state in the guise of a merchant. In doing so, the militarized East India Company broke several laws, treaties, and conventions of the time and created its own laws and treaties as it went along. In India, in the Indo-Pacific, in Britain itself, and of course, on the seas. Leveraged the support of the parliament and invented lobbying that has become the fine art it is today. In a manner of speaking, China is the new Britain. Its one belt, one road is both the instrument, action plan, as well as the objective for global dominance. I won't stretch the analogy because the tactics and strategy are contextually different, but some major signposts are similar. For China, the crown and the company are almost one entity, uh, entity and may become an increasingly militarized one. China has a raft of state-owned enterprises, some that are quasi-private, but owe allegiance with dodgy financial support and overt and covert links to the Communist Party of China, as opposed to the essentially private EIC and without the irritants of having to deal with, say, the Whigs, the liberals, or conscientious objectors here and there. The Communist Party is an all-powerful monolith, has sophisticated internal mechanisms for lobbying and state-owned enterprises, which are willing instruments. Moreover, just like a few officials in London could take care of an expanding company's policy issue by bribing politicians in Britain or officials and rule rulers in India and elsewhere for favors, much like what the CPC's United Front is able to do globally today. In doing so, as recent revelations show, the Chinese twist, bend, ignore, or violate several laws and conventions that govern a rules-based order with spanning trade, intellectual property, corporate governance, and ethics, diplomacy, information and communications, health, of course, as we experience now, environment, nuclear and missile proliferation, and even space. In the maritime environment, we have heard already, there are, of course, the claims and intent impacting on South and East China seas and the littoral. But let's watch out in the Arctic and more distant waters in terms of fishing, environment, ocean resources, and so on. Politically and militarily, India has seen conventions and agreements along the Himalayan border impact us for decades and in recent times, again, quite violently. Talks and tranquility agreements seem little more than words to China. As a supporter of rules-based orders across the Indo-Pacific, India needs to be more publicly concerned about the excessive Chinese claims in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. But there are rubs, and one needs to be fair in saying that some departures or even dismissal of rules-based order but in, in particular cases is something that almost all nations including the United States and in India, are guilty of at time. When ethical relativism is rarely correct in personal ethics, in statecraft, as we understand, it often does exist. However, in pushing for a rules-based order in our world, contradictions create strategic, operational, and tactical difficulties in the several se sectors, planning, diplomacy, information, military, and economic lines. Thus, the United States' attitude to the British Indian Ocean Territory ruling that impacts Diego Garcia and Mauritius and its reluctance to ratify UNCLOS or India's own departures from UNCLOS provisions for certain matters relevant to innocent passage in territorial waters 
all to the freedoms of navigation available in the exclusive economic zone, the EEZ, all need some rethinking. And the recent case with John Paul Jones and the press release thereafter only underscore these. Such departures from a rules-based order increases the degree of difficulty in statecraft and even military craft. In these conditions, no one is really very keen to change to conflict. Yet, 250 years after the time when the East India Company and the British created some common challenges for both our peoples today, we have new challenges which could and must bring the two largest democracies together in a strategic way and not merely at times looking at arms sales and trade. Greater adherence, therefore, to a system of rules and laws, many of which came into existence precisely because the perils of the East India Company began to be seen even by the British government, who benefited from them for some time, is, I think, the better way to go forward. There is merit and a good dose of reality in the naval maxim. Those who rule the waves can more easily wave the rules. The question is a decade from now, which nation or coalition might that be in the Indo-Pacific that may rule the waves and increasingly wave the rules? Thank you so much for your attention. And now I would request Ms. Barua to make her presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rear Admiral Shikande, and uh, thank you so much to Naval War College for this opportunity to uh, to speak at this conference. I just recently moved to DC, so it's definitely is a pleasure to be joining you all from uh, from a similar time zone. Um, uh, Admiral Shikande really spoke about the vast uh, region and the historical perspective, and you did touch touch on the issue of Diego Garcia, I thought I would just briefly uh, provide an overview of the Indian Ocean region and its geopolitical dynamics as uh, what I call as the understudied um, theater of the Indo-Pacific framework. Um, and from there, I would, uh, I, initially I may have been a little too ambitious with my time, but uh, and from there on, I would uh, I'd perhaps focus on the issue of Diego Garcia in laying out how the issue of rules-based order or the issue or the legal issues around, um, around this uh, disputed case is affecting the geopolitical dynamics um, across the Indian Ocean region. The Indian Ocean region, of course, is a very vast area of which, encompass, which encompasses a lot of strategic subregions, whether it's the Bay of Bengal, uh, the Persian Gulf, or the eastern coast of Africa. Uh, the traditional players in the Indian Ocean region, um, and this is a 19, post-1950, uh, post-1945 world, uh, have traditionally been uh, India, US, France, uh, and UK. And the ocean over the years from 1945, especially after the end of the Cold War era, has been increasingly divided into the Eastern Indian Ocean and the Western Indian Ocean. Um, the uh, in uh, traditionally again India is the, India takes a lead in the eastern and northern Indian Ocean, and it's France who takes the lead in the western Indian Ocean, along with the United Kingdom. Um, in in the post Cold War era, the U, U, while U.S. has been very much present in the Indian Ocean region, it has been more in a sense to um, address or uh, address or engage with its problems arising from continental Middle East. Uh, this is all, of course, changing in the in the new Indo-Pacific environment. There are new rising powers, as Admiral uh, Shukande mentioned, but um, it's not just China that is coming into the region as an alternative or as a new player in, uh, into into the um, um, into the Indian Ocean, but also Russia, Saudi Arabia, and to an extent Turkey, depending on which subregion of the Indian Ocean you look at. The division of the Indian Ocean over the years has also meant that governments, when they have been engaging with the Indian Ocean region, has been engaging in silos, in sub-region, and unfortunately, more often through continental sub-regions sub, uh, sub such as Africa desk or South Asia desk or, uh, um, or from the Middle East point of view. But when you look at the Indian Ocean as one theater, a maritime space going from the Straits of Malacca to the eastern coast of Africa, uh, uh, the Persian Gulf and then the Southern Indian Ocean, you see uh, there is a visible change and difference in the Indian Ocean region where also developments and threats and challenges in the Western side that connect to the Eastern side. But because again, this is why I started with the, the, the division of the Indian Ocean is that because it has been so vast that kind of countries over time 
And especially after the end of the Cold War, government has chosen to engage with the Indian Ocean more so in silos and more so through continental deaths than it has uh, uh, as, as one, one continuous space. Uh, one of the new changes, I would say, um, in the Indian Ocean region geopolitically has been the rise of, of islands or, or the um, islands coming to assume a more important or critical role in Indian Ocean, in Indian Ocean politics simply because of the geography. Uh, the islands, again, the, the strategic islands are, of course, divided between island, uh, island nations, so, which are sovereign nations of Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius, Seychelles, Madagascar, and Comoros, stretching from the east in the Straits of Malacca to the west to the eastern coast of Africa, um, and island territories, strategic island territories, which would be uh, the Cocos Keeling of Australia and the Manan Nicobar Islands of India, Diego Garcia, which is again, um, which has a US and UK base, but is, the, but is claimed by Mauritius, La Reunion of France. Uh, it is the geography and the access or, or proximity to, straight, uh, to key geo points connecting the Indian Ocean to the Pacific, to Southeast Asia and other parts of the world, as well as the sea lines of communication that makes these islands so strategic. Uh, it's also why it was very important to the uh, to the British Empire in dominating the Indian Ocean region because of their geography and the proximity to these uh, to these choke points. Um, even as the Indian Ocean remi remains uh, somewhat divided today, um, there is a parallel um, and simultaneous rise of a new Indian Ocean maritime identity across the island nations in the Indian Ocean region. If soon after their independence, most of the island nations were divided into sub-blocks of whether it's African Union or whether it is uh, South Asia or within the realm of IORA, Indian Ocean Rim Association, which of course again includes members uh, from Iran to Australia and South Africa to Indonesia, which is very vast. Um, Today they identify or there is, an, uh, uh, there is more of a rise of an identity as an Indian Ocean player or an Indian Ocean actor, which is assuming very critical geography in the, uh, in the maritime space. Um, each of the traditional players that I mentioned, India, US, uh, France um, and UK has its own relationship with the islands. Um, because of the division of the ocean and to an extent because of the diaspora, India's relationship traditionally has been strongest with India, Sri Lanka, Maldives and Mauritius. Uh, Maldives, Mauritius, India, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, sorry, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles. Uh, France has very deep rooted history and historic uh, and relationship with Madagascar and Comoros, but also with Mauritius and Seychelles, which again speak French. Um, UK is also present in Mauritius, Seychelles and across the other island chain as well as the eastern coast of Africa. US is present essentially through its base in Diego Garcia, but as I mentioned, the increasing engagement in the Indian Ocean has been its engagement for the Middle East and its Gulf Wars. Um, the only country which is even has a, China is the only country with a diplomatic mission in each of the six island nations at this point in time. Um, for all of these island nations sitting in this key geographic um, location across the Indian Ocean region, spanning the e spanning from eastern to the western end of this um, of the ocean, China is quickly emerging as the new and at times also the preferred alternative to traditional players in the region. Um, because of because of time constraints, um, I'm happy to go into why China is a preferred. Uh, alternative at times in Q&A, but as here I wanted to talk about the interesting kind of interplay of geopolitics and, um, and international law in the Indian Ocean region. In most conversations across the region in a changing narrative, in a, in a changing security environment, as the traditional players are scrambling to re-engage with the island nations of the Indian Ocean region, um, the narrative and the conversations has been about a rules-based international order, laws and custom that traditional players respect and um, uh, respect the international, <clears throat> international norms and that China do not respect international norms or rules as much by, by pointing to the cases in the South China Sea and the tribunal uh, uh, with Philippines. Um, the Diego Garcia um, uh, dispute does change that narrative on the ground and to an extent I'm afraid that Washington and London are perhaps not thinking as much about. Um, it also brings in a layer of complexity between India and its, and its partners in the region. Uh, when, when with the initial you know, General Assembly resolution that went on, on Mauritius, France abstained from voting, uh, voting on that, uh, while India voted in favor of Mauritius, 
uh, and against, of course, US and UK. But this is not to say that Diego Garcia is not important or that US presence is not welcome or is a reflection of India-US deteriorating relationship. It's not. In fact, India's relationship on the maritime domain is is strong. Is one, it's, it's, at, it's perhaps at its strongest level. We have signed some of the most uh, found, uh, uh, foundational level um, uh, agreements, and the exercises are getting more complex. But this is also reflective of um, the dynamics in the region and and the narrative of the rules-based international order. Whose rules and which which norms, and who enforces them? The U.S. concern is that the that the base will go to China if it if it acknowledges the uh, the dispute or the sovereignty issue. But we have the the Mauritian Prime Minister at, at multiple forums at the highest level has assured and reassured um, that there is uh, that Mauritius has no intention of uh, dismantling the the base or asking U.S. to leave. Rather, it is a question of acknowledging a colonial leftover, a, a decision made at a, at a at the time of Mauritius independence over the issue of. Uh, Chagos Archipelago, of which Diego Garcia is only one island. 60 islands together comprise the uh, Chagos Archipelago. Uh, London is, of course, driving this conversation because the, the agreement was between Mauritius and in the United Kingdom. And, at the, and, and to much of London's disappointment, US has been, um, pro, uh, uh, sorry, India has been uh, supporting Mauritius on this case on issues of both in the on the need to support international rules and norms and also on the issue of kind of uh, you know that Mauritius has a right to take to seek um, or clarify the issue at the UN level on the uh, on the sovereignty issue uh, but the country which is really maximizing the opportunity of this um, um, of, of this um, of this dispute is really China who is using this opportunity to reshape the narrative on the ground uh, whereas, chi whereas China is going across the island nations and saying that that the, that, that the issue at hand is not about laws or custom, customs, that it is about containing China. Um, there is also a great level of encouragement from Beijing going to other island nations such as Madagascar and Comoros to go to the UN um, over territorial dispute with its other partners. For instance, France has territorial disputes with Madagascar and Comoros in the Mozambique Channel. And Beijing is consistently encouraging these islands to go to the UN to drag the traditional players to the to the to the UN and to see whether they would accept or or, or they would uh, they would respect the rulings and the uh, rulings and the resolutions that come out of it because the world did unite in condemning China when China refused to abide by the ruling of the P, uh, of the PCA ruling in 2016. Um, uh, I, China's reshaping of the narrative on the ground which is based on these facts which has been uh, which has been happening is to also, to also divide and undermine both the impact of UN rulings and the and UN general assembly's resolutions and also to say that china is not um, and that china is a victim to international bullying and not the threat as it is presented to be uh, the case of Diego Garcia most certainly is and will be an important test for Indian Ocean dynamics and going forward. Even if it is a dispute with Mauritius, it impacts all the other smaller nations across the Indian Ocean region who have been in under colonial rules with its traditional players for a very long period of time. And that is also one of the reasons why they see China as an alternative is to say that, um, well, if the argument really is about that China is is a country that does not respect international rules, laws, norms, and custom. Then not neither do the traditional players who have become now the security prefer uh, the security partners for a lot of these countries. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll, end, I'll end on this because I, I hope there'll be a lot, uh, we can discuss a lot more during the Q and A session. Is that um, islands in the pre 1945 world did not have much agencies to affect. Uh, change or impact international environment or the international or, or geopolitical uh, competition as they didn't have that as they would as they were colonies. Today, their choices, foreign policy interests, economic partnerships, as well as defense partnerships will shape the security environment, uh, given the geographic location in the Indian Ocean region. So it is not going to be enough that every time US, India, or um, any of the countries, whether it's France, UK, Australia, or Japan, reacts every time there's a new port that comes up in China, or there's a submarine docking in, in one of Chinese submarine docking in one of the islands in the Indian Ocean region, but the, it would require consistent consistent um, engagement in understanding the perceptions, views of the, of the islands of the Indian Ocean region, because the way we interacted, the way we engaged 
um, in the maritime space in the Indian Ocean region has drastically changed from the 70s and 80s to where we are standing today. Today, islands do have a lot of agency and they do realize the, the, the role it can play, the power that it carries and in and, and, and shaping the international narrative as well as their role in upholding the rules-based international order, which is what most of the traditional players are trying to do. Um, I'll stop here and I hope we can discuss a, go a little bit more deeper into some of these issues during Q&A. Thank you, Ms. Barua, uh, for all the review of the Indian Ocean Islands and, and the nuances of that, which are very, very important. And of course, mention of, you know, uh, of the older players like Russia, uh, come, you know, coming back after the Cold War, where it was a big Indo uh, Indian Ocean player once again. And, and for, you know, outlining the complexities of uh, what the islands are doing, what the islands are experiencing, and they, they, they engine their own place in the Indian Ocean region. So thank you very much for that. And now I request Dr. Uh, Rajpur to uh, present. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Shrikhande. I must say it's indeed a privilege to be speaking at this conference since I've already heard a lot of good things about the conference from my colleagues. And I'm equally delighted that I too have a chance of speaking at this conference. And this certainly would not have been possible without the very generous invitation from the Naval War College. I express my gratitude towards the institution and in particular towards Professor James Kraska for very kindly extending this invitation. I would be failing in my duties to also thank, if I do not thank uh, Commander Pamli for an excellent organization of this session. And she has been very patient and helpful in the, organize, in the process of organizing this, uh, uh, this session. It's also indeed a great privilege to be a part of this distinguished panel being headed by, by, by Admiral Shrikhande. My task really is to speak about the legal issues. So I'm going to look at the issues of maritime security in the Indian Ocean region from the perspective of international law. One of the early areas of international law which were codified or where we, where we developed hard rules is the area of the law of the sea. Because seas are something which not just divide the world, but they also connect the world. And when I say connect the world, it implies joint interests and effects on security of multiple stakeholders, whether they are coastal states in the Indian Ocean or they are not. So when we are speaking about issues of maritime security in relation to Indian Ocean, we need to ask two fundamental questions. First, whose security are we speaking about? And the second, what are those threats to maritime security? Now addressing the first issue, whose security we are speaking about, a traditional understanding would have been of the coastal states. The issue would have been about the states which abut the seas, and it's essentially about the security of these states. What is also understood to be as conventional maritime security, that is stable relationship between coastal states. And now, if we look at it from that perspective, which is just one way of looking, looking at this issue, but not the only way. So when we are looking at this issue in terms of the security of the coastal states, we do see that the region is relatively stable. I'm using the words relatively, except for some peculiar relationships, let's say between India and Pakistan and some other uh, efforts taken by Iran in stopping some, some ships, some vessels from on and off. But apart from that, the region is broadly stable when it comes to relationship between states. And I, I deliberately use this phraseology because I'm comparing it in relation to the South China Sea, where you do have occasions of Chinese vessels throwing, throwing water balloons on, on Philippine vessels and certain other actions, also against fishing and other activities. So in relation to that, this area could be called to be relatively stable. And one of the reasons for that relative stability is most of the maritime delimitation disputes in the region are resolved. 
Now, when we look at the maritime delimitation disputes in the region, a large number of these maritime delimitation disputes have been peacefully resolved through agreement between states without having the need to go to interna any international court or tribunal. Whenever there was such a necessity, states have gone. And a very good example is what Myanmar, Bangladesh did. They went to ITLOS, International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, and what happened between India and Bangladesh. And India, although being a relatively bigger power, very happily gave away its share of maritime claims in the favor, in, 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 in favor of Bangladesh. So that makes the region broadly stable when it comes to the relationship between states. That doesn't mean that the, that the region is peaceful because we do have the peculiar relationship between India and Pakistan. And this peculiar relationship raises several issues of maritime security, particularly in relation to maritime terrorism. Now, the understanding and conceptualizing of, of conceptualization of maritime security has certainly broadened over the years. And when we speak of maritime terrorism, one of the conventional understanding of maritime terrorism, which led to the creation of the, of the SUA convention, was that the threats are essentially to the vessels which are flying on the sea. So the objective of protection was maritime navigation. And that's what the objective of the, of the, of the SUA convention is. But as times have passed by, we do realize that the seas are being used to target the land as well. Therefore, the threat of maritime terrorism is not just limited for installations on the sea, or for vessels flying on the sea, that is maritime navigation, but even on land. So where the sea is being used as a, as a conduit for committing some of, of the maritime terrorist activities. And we have had some of these experiences, for example, example the bomb blasts in, in, in Bombay in 1992 or 2611 incidents in, in, in Mumbai, those speak about, those were the way, those were both all the occasions where seas were fundamentally used to attack the land. Now that's one area of, of maritime terrorism. The second area of, uh, of security concern is, is in relation to, uh, to IUU fishing, illegal unauthorized and, and unreported fishing. Now, on its face, IUU fishing should not create much problems because it, one might say it's just a group of people who are over exploiting the fishing resources. But the problem is much broader than what meets the eye. The reason for this broader problem is it often involves taking over of fishermen of, of, of a different country and prosecuting them. And therefore, despite excellent relationships between India and Sri Lanka, we often see certain degree of discomfort when it comes to fishermen from one country going into jurisdiction of another country and fishing. So IUU fishing may result into tense relationships between states. It may not be as serious as a boundary dispute, but it can nevertheless be an extremely sensitive issue which might bring states at loggerheads. Unfortunately, not many states in the Indian Ocean region are, are state parties to, to the IUU convention which means a lot of the area remains unregulated. Now, the, in, in, in relation to, to maritime security, apart from, uh, from, the, from the threats to navigation and apart from the threats to the, to the coastal states, uh, we, as, as I already mentioned, that broadly speaking, the, most of the maritime uh, delit delimitation disputes are settled in the region. So th there's, there's relatively peace in, uh, peace in the region. But now the question is, what is the power that a coastal state can exercise in relation to countering some of these maritime, uh, maritime security threats? Now, in response to these maritime security threats, we go back to the most classical framework of United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, one of the problems of the approaches of the law of the sea that it was still taking into account the classical threats of, of, of maritime security. In fact, doesn't really deal about maritime security issues except to the extent of piracy, which is the only prominent issue which figures out in, in, in UNCLOS. And the curious part about uh, the provisions on piracy is that a coastal state 
can interdict a vessel, not just within the territorial sea, but even outside the territorial sea in the continental shelf and in the high seas. This gives a great deal of discretion to the coastal states in terms of the right to interdict a vessel, ask for, for information. However, the problem is if the information, if the interdiction was found to be improper, the coastal state might have to pay compensation. Now let us take the situation of a threat of a terrorist attack, where there's a small vessel which is intended to commit a terrorist act, either ramming itself in a vessel or that small vessel is intended to be used to be taken on a coastal state and then to commit a terrorist attack there. On such occasions, the framework of UNCLOS is quite unhelpful. In fact, the SUA convention, the protocol tried to address some of these problems, but still the focus is on the flag state. It might be too late for a coastal state to wait for a flag state to really get into these issues and trying to address them. Therefore, in view of this peculiarity, we do see that UNCLOS does not provide for necessary flexibility or necessary power, as one might say, when it comes to matters of, pro of protecting their own coasts or protecting maritime navigation. But then another argument is that the continental shelf, as well as the high seas, are to be used with due regard. The obligation of due regard stipulated by UNCLOS is on all states. And since all states are under that obligation, if there is a threat to a coast, the coastal state and its, its naval force would be very much justified in use of necessary force, which is proportionate to neutralize such a threat. So what we do see is there are aspects of uncovered areas of international law. And it's not uncommon for international law to have several areas uncovered. So it, is no, it should not be seen as a drawback of UNCLOS in any manner. Rather, it should be rather seen as a flexibility which states have, which is of course subject to the overarching principles and overarching rules of the United Nations, of the United Nations Charter. Now, one prominent issue of the Indian Ocean, which has rather made the Indian Ocean a topic of great discussion or maritime security in the, in the Indian Ocean of great discussion is the, is the concern of piracy, which has been happening off the coast of Somalia. Now, it's really rare to get a Security Council to pass a resolution under Chapter 7, which is a binding resolution. And it is one of the rare occasions in relation to piracy along the coast of Somalia that the Security Council has allowed, or rather it allowed for initial period of six months for any state to go and take enforcement measures against pirates in the territorial sea of Somalia. Because otherwise states are not, would, would, would not be allowed to go into territorial sea of, of another state because the restriction is you can go only in terms of an innocent passage. Now this kind of a paradigm uh, is, a is a situation which was necessitated as a peculiarity and it existed only as a peculiar situation in relation to threats in, uh, arising out of, out of Somalia. But as we, as we progress over the years, the threat has reduced. Uh, Secretary General in his reports to the, to the Security Council has informed the Security Council that the threats are reduced, but nevertheless, the threat exists and collective action in relation to piracy would certainly remain on the edge. Now to speak briefly, very briefly for a, for a couple of minutes about the regional architecture. We certainly do not have any strong solid structure like the NATO in place in the Indian Ocean region, which is understandable or rather obvious due to the diverse interests of various states involved in this region and their interests don't necessarily align with each other. We do have the IORA, and the IORA is also uh, trying to have some sort of discussions. It had its first meeting in 2019 on security issues, but we see that the discussion is essentially about, uh, uh, about rescue missions on the sea, and it doesn't get into what we might say hard, hard maritime security related issues. Of course, there is the Quad, where there is uh, not under the IRA framework, but between four states, there is, there is the discussion ongoing. But this is again about collaboration between militaries 
uh, between naval forces of, of these states. It's essentially about threats to the state per se from, from another state. But there are, issue, there are smaller threats in the form of say IUU fishing or in the form of a threat of a terrorist vessel, which, uh, which may attack a vessel flying on the sea or which may create, which may create a threat for the, for the coastal state. So we do have these host of threats, but we don't have any solid discussion happening under the framework of IORA. A ASEAN in relation to its own states is, is, is having some sort of discussions, but, but the Indian Ocean region is honestly far away from, from getting anywhere close to have a stronger collaboration to address some of these points. I haven't addressed the issue of, of, of travel of weapons of mass destruction because we do have the pro proliferation of security initiative, which was floated by President Bush, trying to have, have an informal uh, um, network between states in order to interdict and stop, uh, stop uh, transport of, of weapons of mass destruction. We still don't know how such a regime would function within, uh, within the region because not many states are parties to this, uh, to this PSI. So we do see a situation where law is relatively nascent and the law is relatively nascent because the attention to the, to, to, the, to, the, to the region is nascent. As the attention of scholars, as the attention of these states and the stakes increase, I do see that here is the potential for international law to grow because if international law grows, then we are in a position of having a rule-based international legal order. It's not an order just for the sake of it. It's in order to ensure that the relationships between states are peaceful and stable since we all are a part of a global society. I would stop there and look forward to questions and answers. Thank you, Dr. Rajput, for uh that overview on uh, uh, what is happening in the Indian Ocean with, uh, with regard to IUU, issues of the Sosua, maritime terrorism, certainly very important, and some of the other issues and the need for IORA itself to get more proactive, come together for better making of rules, and then, of course, following you know more participation in a rules-based order. I would like here, you know, when we wait for audience questions, uh, perhaps uh, would you would you touch upon, you know, the recent uh, cases of a lot of drugs having been confiscated at sea uh, by India, by Canada, uh, and others over over the past few years, but of late the catches are growing, and we know now in in various conferences, Sri Lanka and Maldives are also very very concerned about this new maritime drug route. Um, that 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 is something that I think more needs to be done on a cooperative basis. And what might be the long term sort of dangers that come out of that, and what could be some measures other than you know ships, of course, going out and you know confiscating them, as has happened in the recent past. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question, and we have to look at it from the from the law and the factual factual part of it. Looking at the factual part, the major part of it would be addressed through collaboration and coordination and speaking to each other and, 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 and information exchange, which is an integral part in such processes. But the legal part is equally important, and that is an issue of who can exercise jurisdiction and to what extent. Now, the problem is when it comes to issues of drugs, uh, drug peddling, often it's a matter which falls within uh, the enforcement jurisdiction of, of coastal state and enforcement jurisdiction would normally go up to the territorial sea and then go up to further 12 nautical miles in the, in the contiguous zone. Interestingly, the very reason why the contiguous zone was created because there were these drug dealers who used to often ply just outside the territorial sea, teasing the, uh, teasing the Navy of the coastal state saying, you can't touch us because we are in the high seas. So that's why we have that 24, uh, 12, more nautical miles of, of contiguous zone where still the rights are, are not as rigorous as in the territorial sea, but as not as weak in the continental shelf or EEZ, but nevertheless, they are of a, of a higher degree, but they're still in enforcement nature. So that's also to what extent they can be pursued. 
not uh, because uh, the only way under the UNCLO under UNCLOS you can pursue uh, people outside the con territorial sea or the contiguous zone is, is in, in relation to piracy. So there are restrictions otherwise. So there is a, a large element of coordination and collaboration. So despite silence of the legal regime, it doesn't mean that measures cannot be undertaken. There, there is a possibility of mutual coordination and cooperation between the states. And that is something which can help them to address these issues. And, uh, you know, Ms. Barua, could you, could you explain a little more what your thoughts are on two issues? One is what what more can the Indian Ocean Rim Association do in terms of uh, maritime security, in terms of uh, other issues of, you know, uh, I, I don't personally like, like the term non-traditional security threats because, you know, all these are actually very traditional security threats, including climate change itself, which has happened in centuries past. So they're very traditional threats. Nonetheless, even if we want to call them in a scholarly uh, 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 angle uh, as non-traditional, what more can IORA do? And the second question is, therefore, what do you think might be changing American position on Diego Garcia? As you mentioned, you know, the Prime Minister has made, made the point several times about, you know, having some arrangement. Uh, do you think there's progress on, on that as far as, you know, UK, US and Mauritius are concerned? Um, uh, thank you, Admiral Shikande. Um, actually, I, I think you you probably perhaps the first uh, person I've heard from the naval community who's taken a, a thing to the non-traditional security issues. Usually, I, it's the opposite when I try, you try to talk about you know these issues. It's like, well, it's not important enough. So, do we really need to assign that much sources or resources to it? But uh, no, absolutely. And I think today there is even more of an um, convergence or I would say overlap of traditional sec hard security versus soft security, because as, as you were aware, of course, you can today you're using fishing vessels for intelligence collections or even surveillance and um, other, uh, other um, I guess, methods and purposes that has a more implication for harder security issues than, say, for uh, fishing or, or, or any of these issues like illegal fishing or, or climate, uh, climate change. Um, I think the problem with Ayura is also the challenge has been that it's a very um, big uh, regional institution which has members from, as I mentioned, from Iran to Australia and Indonesia to South Africa. So the social fabric, the politics of each of the member states is so different at times and so, uh, so varied that it is quite difficult to come to, I guess, um, agreement on issues of um, that are of uh, importance to everybody. But there are some issues like, for instance, blue economy, which is a pillar like kind of within the IORA uh, pillar that uh, that IORA is trying to do more. But um, there is, in fact, very little agreement on what constitutes blue economy and what the process should be going forward. In fact, it has been the island nations like Sessions who's taken a lead on this. And I think they should be um, driving that conversation that IORA could become that platform to uh, discuss, uh, debate, and perhaps negotiate or some sort of a framework for some of these issues, whether it's climate change, whether it's illegal fishing, whether it's blue economy. Um, even from a point of view of, say, um, if you look at the Pacific um, Islands, you have the Pacific Island forums and where you have bigger players as part of it, either as members or as observers, but the conversation is driven by the 14 islands together. Of course, there are divisions within it as we are seeing today, but we don't have a framework like that in the Indian Ocean region. You have the Indian Ocean Commission, which is the five island states of four, actually, Mauritius, Sessions, Madagascar, and Comoros, that does not include Sri Lanka and Mal uh, Maldives, which are the non French speaking um, countries. So I think they could be, it could be useful to kind of create or, or uh, lead um, uh, lead some of these softer issues or soft security, I guess, uh, these security issues um, by the by the smaller nations or littoral nations who who face some more of an existential threat from these issues than rather say I would say U.S. or India or France or U.K. Um, on 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 the question of Diego Garcia, I think the it it is a complicated uh, position on it in, um, because. For, for a very long time, Washington's position was also officially, whether it was in conversation with India or with Mauritius, is that it's a bilateral dispute between UK and um, Mauritius. And that, of course, the base is utilized and is of use to the US and UK is the, it's, it's, it's very important transatlantic ally. 
Um, I don't see. I don't see U.S. taking a different path unless London is willing to have a conversation around it. In the sense, I do not see U.S. and U.K. taking different paths to it, in which U.K. says that it is not willing or it is not um, looking to discuss or, or renegotiate the agreement around the MRC, and U.S. says that it does. Even if the government here maybe somewhat at some level recognizes the need to go back to the table, or there might be conversations around it, uh, it is not going to be a bilateral conversation between the U.S. and Mauritius, uh, although there might be merit to it, because it has to be a joint collaboration between U.S. and U.K. Because the agree U.S. agreement is with the United Kingdom, and United Kingdom's agreement is with Mauritius, because it's not a straightforward. In fact, the Mauritius Prime Minister has also indicated that perhaps it can renew the base directly with the United States and not through London, but it would complicate the transatlantic relationship. So. Um, It is going to be very complicated politically. I have not seen or heard conversations when Washington might be willing or ready to have that conversation bilaterally or individually with Mauritius, or willing to take a path which is not inconsistent with the um, London view. Great, thanks. Uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, there are a couple of audience questions, um, and one of them is about what uh, does it need to expand its scope and try and include Southeast Asian countries. To make it more inclusive, but I would say that the board, you know, uh, initially does need to uh, consolidate within itself and and look for you know getting into a quad plus uh, in in various areas. And there is there is certainly a, a great consonance between all quad members uh, currently and the ASEAN itself in issues of freedom of navigation, freedom of the Indo-Pacific. And the ASEAN's, uh, you know, concerns uh, that that relate to uh, these issues, as well as more specific concerns about South China Sea itself. So yes, what uh, needs to consolidate, needs to deepen, and you know, gradually expand, because that is one way of uh, bringing bringing some coherence into into uh, action plans, and in some cases. Uh, uh, Form a you know a counterbalance to some of the steps that that China is taking to be able to actually further peace uh, and and some level of tranquility in times to come. Uh, there was also another question uh, about uh, uh, about China coming into the Indian Ocean region. Well, I think you know as I mentioned, China is already in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, As a, it has of course legitimate interests and and therefore uh, uh, presence, but it has other concerns. As I brought, tried to bring out in in my opening remarks itself, uh, there are parallels without stretching the analogy. As I said, uh, between what happened uh, with Britain, uh, and I and I do feel that way that it's probably not incorrect to say that in some ways for the U.S. and for India and for various. Uh, 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 smaller island nations in in the Indian Ocean region, the Indian Ocean Rim itself. That in many ways, China is the new Britain, and uh, that is something we need to think about. Uh, there was another question which I'm trying to get again. Sir, I think we might have to to oh. close oh. out because uh, we are on our edge of time, but very glad to have these questions. So I turn it to you to, to close the panel and then we will take a shorter break and move to our final keynote. So over to you, Admiral. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Commander Pansley, and uh, thank you, Dr. Kraska, for uh, arranging this session. Uh, I think we are running out of time, so I won't, I won't try and uh, sum up anything, but certainly the Indo-Pacific and specifically the Indian Ocean region Is is a place for a lot of uh, issues and concerns, and I think larger larger aspects of diplomacy, uh, the political coherence are very important. And to some extent, I think uh, the maritime services that operate in the Indian Ocean region uh, need to uh, uh, maintain a, a a very close vigil about a whole lot of threats uh, and uh, activities that are taking place. And therefore, I think this case is going to remain interesting, and uh, we'll all all be interested uh, in the interesting environment in the Indian Ocean region. So, thank you very much, uh, Newport, uh, for this opportunity. Signing off.
Thank you all. Thank you, Admiral, very much for moderating such a rich discussion. Thank you to Ms. Barua and Dr. Rajput for bringing some very interesting perspectives, and perspectives about the Indian Ocean maritime security, which indeed is a broad region. And as Dr. Rajput said, the seas connect the world, and I'm very grateful we could all connect on Zoom today, and hopefully soon we can do this in person. So thank you very much. Um, we will take a brief break. We'll cut it short for about five minutes and return at minute 45 Eastern Standard Time. So that would be 1445 Eastern Standard Time for our keynote address from Professor Natalie Klein. So see you all in about five minutes. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Dr. Rajput. Thank you, Ms. Barua. Thank you very much, uh, all, of, all participants and, and the administration. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's quite incredible that we've already almost completed day two. We've had such vibrant discussion today. And now we're moving to session eight, keynote and final remarks. And we're delighted to have Professor Natalie Klein, Faculty of Law at University of New South Wales, Sydney, join us for closing keynote remarks. So Dr. Klein, over to you. Thanks so much, Pam. And uh, well, good morning to everyone from where I am, but good afternoon to you all. Uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to present. Um, I'm hoping I can share my screen and show you a PowerPoint with my presentation. If you can confirm that you're seeing that. Yes, ma'am, looks great. All right, good to know. All right. Um, as you can see, the, the title of my presentation is to focus on Australian maritime legal challenges. Uh, that was the, the topic I was asked to address. And uh, I thought that what might be useful to focus on uh, in a conference that's sort of looking at the rule of law is to think a little bit more about uh, those challenges in the context of a rules-based international order. So Australia sits well within the frame of the Indo-Pacific region. And that's particularly because one of Australia's strategic defence interests is a stable Indo-Pacific region and uh, also a rules-based global order. So as a stable Indo-Pacific region seems to go hand in hand with a rules-based order, I thought it would be useful to address Australia's maritime legal challenges through this lens of a rules-based order and consider the international implications of such an approach. So in doing so, I just wanted to uh, give you a very brief overview of what Australia's position is within the Indo-Pacific and uh, consider then, uh, given Australia's constant rhetoric around the rules-based order, contemplate briefly what that might actually mean and particularly then what it means for international law. And then look at that, uh, zero in on three specific challenges that I think Australia faces and that concerns first navigation, then what we tend to refer to as boat migration or migration by sea, and IUU fishing, and then try and draw out some common themes from all of that. Now, looking at Australia's position in the Indo-Pacific, I note my, my map uh, orients us a little further south than the map that you've been looking at. Uh, but what's interesting for Australia, and one of my colleagues, Erica Tichero, who's based at the University of Western Australia and, and focuses a lot of her research on the Indian Ocean and the blue economy, she's observed that when we look at Australia's different policy approaches uh, to the oceans, we can divide them along the four points of a compass. And essentially, depending on which way you're looking, uh, that varies Australia's particular policy approach. So... Uh, given that we are focused on the Indo-Pacific, uh, the southern point of our compass is perhaps less relevant, but I do think it's important to mention Australia has keen interests in the southern ocean, which extend down to Antarctica. And there our focus really is more so on questions about conservation and research, even though Australia is also, of course, keenly aware of some of the geopolitical uh, strategic competitions in relation to Antarctica as well. When we go west, uh, I think it is fair to say that Australia's focus has not been very strong on the Indian Ocean compared to our approaches looking north and east uh, traditionally. And Iora itself, you've just been hearing about, it's still a relatively recent um, and, as was just noted by one of the speakers, a disparate 
organization. Australia's really only stepped up to try and take more of a leadership role really within the last seven years or so. When Australia looks north, uh, we have direct national security interests given the relative proximity of our neighbors to the north and the need to ensure sea lanes of communication uh, through the Indonesian and Philippine archipelago. And China does remain one of Australia's most significant trading partners, despite uh, recent and ongoing tensions. So passage through the South China Sea for commercial shipping is critical. Uh, Tichera has observed in going through these points of the compass that Australia's high level of engagement with regional organisations to our north um, includes with the ASEAN Regional Forum and also the East Asia Summit, and there are many bilateral initiatives being pursued to meet security and strategic objectives. Finally, to Australia's east lies the Pacific, and Tichera considers that Australia's approach to the east is primarily focused on capacity building and development. Australia has traditionally been involved in the regional governance uh, mechanisms that are established in the east around the Pacific, especially relating to fisheries. So in some Australia's policy interests do shift depending on whether we're moving north to the west to the east across the Indo-Pacific. But what is consistent is that Australia stresses the need for stability and adherence to the rules-based order. So Australia's Department of Defence emphasised just last year in its strategic update that Australia will continue to be an active and vocal advocate for a rules-based international order designed to support economic growth, security, prosperity, and our values. And this includes support for laws and treaties such as the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So what do we actually mean by the rules-based order? The Department of Defence has kindly um, sought to provide a definition for us and said that it means a shared commitment by all countries to conduct their activities in accordance with agreed rules which evolve over time, such as international law and regional security arrangements. Australia is really referring to the international governance mechanism that's been in place really since the end of World War II. In terms of what other countries mean, Australia is not, of course, unique in referring to the rules-based order. We hear it from a number of other countries. It seems that uh, when it's referred to within the Asian region, that there is more of an emphasis on the rule of law. Certainly, Japan has uh, advocated for a rules-based international order and one that uh, promotes peaceful conflict resolution, free navigation and free trade, less emphasis on democratic arrangements and human rights. Uh, China's foreign minister has also referred to a rules-based order as well, but emphasizes sovereignty and the UN Charter in that context. Uh, one commentator thinks that, uh, has noted that Russia's view of the rules-based order is that it is really an attempt to deviate from international law for political expediency. Now, I was quite excited when I began seeing so much emphasis on the rules-based order in various government statements. Naively, I, I thought this reflected a warm embrace of international law and its relevance to manage state decision-making and state interactions. And while there are different views on the rules-based order, I think it's safe to say that the rules-based order and international law are not the same thing. The rules-based order is broader than international law. So it's not just the formal sources of international law that we'd be familiar with in terms of treaties and customary international law, but it also encompasses the use of soft law <coughs> or non-binding agreements or informal agreements as I tend to call them. So in the international system, in, informal agreements can be quite useful because they create shared expectations as to the standards of behavior or conduct in relation to specific international issues. The rules-based order also is not just hard law or soft law, but also encompasses shared norms or governance structures or arrangements or processes. So it's not just actual agreements, but also the processes and institutions that produce the agreements, monitor them, and potentially engage in their revision. So the rules-based order definitely anticipates that the rules will evolve and change over time. So let's consider this dynamic in relation to some of Australia's specific uh, legal challenges. So as I mentioned before, Australia's navigational interests to the north include being able to transit 
uh, through the Indonesian archipelago and reach important ports in both Southeast Asia and North Asia. So the legal challenges for Australia um, to the north can be summarized really, uh, there's quite a few as including uh, ensuring the passage of commercial shipping consistent with the freedom of navigation. And while navigational rights for commercial shipping hasn't really been directly challenged, uh, we did face a situation earlier this year of ships holding Australian goods being barred from entering Chinese ports. And this was not so much about the freedom of navigation under UNCLOS, but really more so about customary law rights of access to ports, as well as international trade rules. The inability to deliver goods in a timely manner also raised a number of questions about uh, the carriage of goods by sea, insurance claims, and also the rights of the crew who were on board and who were then held on vessels for much longer than anticipated. Another legal challenge, of course, includes the movement and actions of warships. And uh, in this respect, you would be familiar with the range of challenges and I'm sure have been talked about over the last uh, two days already, including issues around prior notification or authorization in the territorial sea, uh, challenges merging in relation to military activities in the EEZ of other countries, including military research, and also questions concerning contested territorial sovereignty and contested maritime delimitation affecting the characterization of maritime zones and uh, the concomitant rights and duties in those particular zones. And of course, uh, the exercise of law enforcement powers uh, also comes up and particularly the roles being ascribed to fishing militia and uh, the new powers being given to the Chinese Coast Guard considering the lawful uh, parameters of, of escort and considering if there's any change in the rules relating to the use of force. So for Australia to respond to some of these legal challenges, uh, Australia does have its own freedom of navigation program that began in the 1990s and is similar to the US program in as much that it involves at sea operations as well as diplomatic uh, exchanges. But uh, despite Australia's strong economic and strategic interests to the north, we haven't really gone as far as the United States in terms of the types of and locations of the FONOPs um, that the US has undertaken. So, for example, as far as I'm aware, Australia does not send its warships through the territorial sea of contested uh, islands in the South China Sea, though the Australian Navy does sail through the South China Sea, often on its way to uh, joint military exercises with its allies. And it has been closely followed by the Chinese military and reportedly last year had what were called unplanned interactions uh, with the Chinese, in, and that was in July of last year. A statement issued by the Australian Department of Defence at the time observed that the interactions were conducted in a safe and professional manner. And this statement I thought alluded to an underlying legal regime of the coal regs, which um, the regulations relating to collision, which we tend to think of as the rules of the road uh, at sea. And also potentially having bearing on this interaction was also the code for unplanned uh, encounters at sea or the queues. And the two main aspects of the queues are to set out safety procedures and provide communication procedures. So although the queues has as a standard that it is seeking to establish international standards, the document's very clear as to the status of the queues as a non-binding legal instrument. So it's an informal agreement as part of our rules-based order. And arguably it does provide some more details on what we might expect of the legal standard of due regard at sea. But uh, the queues has its limitations as recognized by various commentators, including some of you who are here today, and not least because it's legally non-binding, but also because of its scope of application in that it only covers warships and it's only for unplanned encounters. Now, rather than direct confronta confrontations or operations at sea, Australia has uh, issued uh, statements to the United Nations in which, among other things, it has objected to China's use of straight baselines to encircle the island groups in the South China Sea. And the statement that was issued um, most recently 
was notable because of its categorical statements about which of China's actions Australia considered to be in violation of UNCLOS. And I think it's quite good for Australia to stand firm on these specifics of international law, and also preferable to emphasize the coal regs as the binding legal regime, rather than the cues I think would be beneficial. What does it mean uh, if we put binding rules of international law in instruments that are explicitly stated to be non-binding, we need to be careful not to diminish treaty rules through the use of informal instruments. Turning to uh, the second uh, specific challenge that I wanted to mention for Australia, again, looking north, but also to our west, we can consider Australia's efforts to reduce, if not eliminate, migration by sea to Australia. So boat migration has been an issue for Australia really since the 1970s, but more particularly since the turn of the century, following the arrival of the Tampa, which had uh, over 400 uh, irregular migrants on board who had been rescued by a Norwegian cargo ship, which then sought to deliver those people to Christmas Island, but were met by Australia's special armed services. The Tampa introduced uh, sweeping changes to Australia's migration laws and also changes at the international level around the rules relating to search and rescue. And we do have a strong legal framework in place here with UNCLOS, the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, the Search and Rescue Convention, and also the Migrant Smuggling Protocol. Some of the ambiguities in the Search and Rescue Convention and uh, also to the SOLAS Convention have been addressed in a set of guidelines, which is an informal instrument that was adopted by the International Maritime Organization at the same time as the, the more recent um, amendments to those instruments. Now, Australia could be accused, I think, of cherry picking its preferred rules when it comes to the rules-based order because it places little emphasis on international refugee law and international human rights law when it responds to migration by sea and in implementing these obligations into its domestic law. So, for example, concerns have been raised under international refugee law when Australia has sought to return Sri Lankan migrants uh, who are seeking asylum to Sri Lanka. And a recent Australia Border Force initiative has seen the delivery of drones to Sri Lanka to assist in surveillance to counter people smuggling operation as well as other crimes at sea. And this surveillance raises a range of legal questions that feed into others relating to the use of maritime autonomous vehicles. Uh, but in our rules-based order, we also have to look not just at formal sources of law and these soft law instruments I've mentioned, but also to the regional arrangements that support strategic endeavours. Sorry, consistent uh, with the view from Australia's foreign policy white paper uh, to support a balance in the Indo-Pacific favourable to our interests and promote an open and inclusive rules-based region, Australia also works more closely with the region's major democracies bilaterally and in small groupings. And I think the Bali process, which Australia co-chairs uh, with Indonesia and that was set up to deal with, amongst other things, um, the resettlement of refugees and also um, migrant smuggling uh, is kind of notable in this regard. And the Bali process was established in 2002, again, not long after the Tampa incident, as a forum for policy dialogue, information sharing and practical cooperation to help the region. And the Bali process has been put in the spotlight recently with the Andaman Sea um, migration movements. And there's no doubt an important place uh, for mechanisms that promote information sharing and cooperation, as well as allowing for capacity building. These dimensions, I think, are critical for a stable Indo-Pacific region. So it makes sense for the rules-based order to encapsulate these sorts of initiatives, which are intended to take legal frameworks into account. My concern is that things like the Bali process should not come at the expense of applicable international law. The 2016 declaration coming from the Bali process does reference international law quite generally, but the only international law mentioned in the 2018 declaration from the Bali process are the two global compacts, which are important, but non-binding instruments. Now, to turn to our third maritime legal challenge, uh, and that concerns Australia's uh, responses to IUU fishing. 
And this is a problem for Australia in several different directions, certainly south extending uh, into the Antarctic, where Australia has been particularly concerned about overfishing of Patagonian toothfish and also other illegal fishing around the Heard and McDonald Islands down to the south. But also to the north, Australia has encountered difficulties with the, uh, the enforcement of what's known as the Indonesian MOU box, uh, which is an area within Australia's fishing zone where in traditional Indonesian fishers are allowed to come and are not uh, compelled to follow Australia's laws. But there have been concerns about uh, more commercial fishing happening and also exploitation uh, around them to the outside of the MOU box. And similarly, Australia has the Torres Strait Treaty with Papua New Guinea, which supports traditional fishing again, but uh, concerns around increasing commercialization of fishing within that area and other influences in uh, the fishing industry emerging recently. Now, these uh, two particular fishing arrangements in relation to Indonesia and Papua New Guinea are covered uh, by an MOU and a treaty respectively. But Australia is also engaged in this issue uh, in the region to the north, uh, particularly one example is the 2017 Statement of Cooperation on the Need to Deter IUU Fishing, which was adopted at the ASEAN Regional Forum. But also notably, Australia has taken a range of steps to address illegal fishing in the Pacific Ocean as well. And as I mentioned at the outset, Australia is very involved in the relevant regional fora, including uh, the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency. Now, when it comes to IUU fishing, I think the legal framework is actually quite vast and it does include a plethora of treaties as well as informal agreements. And these include uh, UNCLOS, the 1995 Fish Stocks Agreement, the more recent Port State Measures Agreement. There are instruments being adopted under the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, also within regional fisheries management organizations, which have treaties and decisions that are adopted. Uh, Australia does dedicate resources to supporting monitoring, control and surveillance. Of course, a question whether it dedicates enough resources uh, because law enforcement remains really the critical challenge um, in being able to address IUU fishing. But in terms of the rules based order, in this instance, I have less concerns about the diversity of tools being brought to bear to deal with this problem and the international laws being diminished as a result. In this instance, the rules-based order with all of its component parts can potentially work when these parts are complementary and positively reinforcing the response to the problem. So to try and, and bring these points together, um, I should just note though that though I've, I've highlighted very briefly three maritime legal challenges for Australia, those are of course not the only ones. We've also have concerns around the security of our submarine cables, also, of course, uh, concerns about the marine environment and pollution of the marine environment. Uh, also, some elements in Australia have concern about climate change and the necessary responses for that, and also concerns about maritime crime, including drug smuggling. Now, to meet these challenges, Australia does need international law. It's international law that provides us with our maritime rights that we are now seeking to protect in different ways. Now, but as Bisley notes, over the past decade or so, the rules-based international order has become a rhetorical centerpiece of Australian international policy. Now, rhetoric has its place and its value, but I think as international lawyers, it is incumbent on us to dive a bit more deeply and insist on a preeminent place for international treaties and customary international law. We have to realize that there are limits to the value that should be ascribed to informal agreements. And we need to ensure that they are not antagonistic, uh, to borrow a term from Schaffer and Pollock, to, that they are not antagonistic to the existing hard law. And when we are dealing with mechanisms and processes and arrangements that are developed within the rules-based order, we should think carefully about how they might reinforce international law. Do they allow for accountability? Do they enhance the day-to-day -day implementation of international standards? Do they provide an appropriate mechanism to revise or update international law? So as the title of uh, my presentation suggests, it might be a juggling act, but I would say let's make sure international law is the safety net 
and not one of the balls being tossed around at risk of being dropped. So thank you for your attention. I should also do a little disclaimer. These are quite preliminary thoughts and I'm looking uh, to elaborate on these for the full written paper for the International Legal Studies. And I'd be very pleased to receive comments even by email on uh, my thoughts on that. So thank you for your attention and your time. Thank you, Professor Klein, for a lovely close to our second day of the conference. Really appreciate your thoughts. And I like the idea of a, the warm embrace of a rules-based order, but imagine we have far to go for that. Um, thank you in particular for getting up so early. I know it's quite early where you are in Sydney. And a, a gracious thank you to all our panelists that tuned in from across time zones today to provide such a rich and dynamic discussion on such a variety of topics. I've learned a lot and I certainly hope our audience has as well. Um, so this closes day two of the Cushing Conference. We thank you all for joining us today. I hope you will all join us tomorrow for day three. We start again promptly at 1100 Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And thank you all again. This ends day two. Have a great afternoon, evening, and morning. <laughs>